Good morning, uh, my name is Emmanuel Jorzinko. I'm one of the co-organizers of this conference. Welcome to the 2021 fourth edition of uh, the Private Markets Research Conference. Since uh, the inception of this conference in June 2017, the uh, Private Markets Research serves as a forum to explore the latest research advances. Uh, this year's conference is no different from the other editions, and it will focus on two main thematics. The first will be on ESG investing for private equity, and the second will be on applications of artificial intelligence in private markets. Uh, today, we are very happy and very lucky, in fact, to have a great lineup of uh, academic speakers uh, with two great speakers, one which is present that will join me in a few minutes, Rudy Fallenbach from EPFL, and Ludovic Falipou from Oxford that is online. We got also uh, a very interesting setup, uh, a lineup of practitioners that will join us. Uh, those two conferences will be each organized uh, as follows. We will start with an academic presentation. Uh, we'll be joined by a practitioner for a discussion. Then we'll have uh, um, a sponsor industry presentation, and we'll finish with a panel session uh, with about 30 minutes. Uh, the audience will have the possibility, in fact, to ask Q&A using uh, the chat box. So before uh, we start first, uh, I will want to take the opportunity to thank our partners, so our two academic partners, uh, namely uh, Paris University Dauphine and EPFL, and our three corporate par partners uh, for this edition, Unigestion, Ifront, and Campbell Utens. And before I introduce our first speaker, I would just uh, let uh, Serge Darol uh, from Paris Dauphine uh, tell you some few words about this conference. Serge. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, so uh, I would like uh, to say a few words about the implication of the House of Finance of Paris Dauphine in this event. So we are very happy to academically host uh, this, I don't know, uh, to academically host this international event organized in Geneva this year. So we start this project with Emmanuel uh, five years ago in Lausanne and after uh, in Montreux and now in Geneva. And uh, we decided last year to postpone the event due to the pandemic. Uh, so it uh, was a hard decision to say, but we have the opportunity to relaunch the conference this year with uh, the support of Unigestion. And of course, we thank uh, Unigestion for this. And uh, we did it. So of course, you will say that uh, the format is different, less ad academic, I will say, but uh, interesting, of course, on a very interesting topic. And what is really interesting is that the new format uh, gives us the opportunity to increase the audience of the conference. We have more than uh, 300 uh, people registered to the conference this year. So it's much more than we had uh, the previous years. Uh, and we uh, expect to uh, stay at this level for the next year. So when we uh, look at the list of uh, the attendees, uh, it's uh, really impressive to see that we have a mix of students, academics, asset managers, and investors. So we expect to return live last year, next year, uh, but uh, we also want to uh, welcome you all uh, in around the lake next year. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Thank you, Serge. Um, so now let's open the first uh, session. Uh, title is ESG and Private Equity. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first academic speaker, so Rudy Be Rudiger Falemba. So Rudy, just a, a very, very brief uh, intro, is a full professor at Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, EPFL, in Switzerland, uh, where he holds a senior research grant from the SFI. Uh, he graduated with a PhD in finance from uh, the University of Pennsylvania, Wharton, and his uh, research interests are on corporate finance and private equity. Uh, Rudiger has 
made a lot of uh, top uh, level academic publication, but also his research have been reported in many uh, journals, like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Rudy is a frequent speaker at conferences, and he teaches corporate finance in several executive uh, programs at IMD, APFL, and SFI. Uh, and I think Rudy also uh, received a, a, a recently a grant from uh, Norges Bank on uh, EHG, on, on, on the institutional uh, uh, investor ESG preferences, uh, looking to the proxy voting guidelines uh, of those investors. Okay, so today Rudy's presentation will, uh, uh, it will show us, in fact, a kind of overview about uh, the recent academic research result with respect to the impact of uh, private equity funds uh, with respect to the three dimension, environmental, societal, and governance. Uh, I will be joined by Yegor Tokaveric from a uh, uh, substance over form firm. Uh, there will be a discussion. Now I'm done. Rudy, the floor is yours. Please, welcome. Thank you very much um, for the kind words, um, Emmanuel. So in the next 15 minutes or so, I want to give you, if you want, set the stage. So private equity and ESG, what are we talking about? What are some of the challenges and opportunities? Then I'm going to give you an overview of the recent academic research on the topic. Uh, three points, really. First, ESG maximization coincides with shareholder value maximization. ESG maximization may mean other things than shareholder value maximization, so stakeholders, other people involved in the firm. And just one, I think, fairly convincing example how just multidimensional ESG reporting is. And then I'm really looking forward to discuss many of these issues with uh, Jigo Tokarovic, the CEO of Substance Overform. Okay, so why should we be excited about ESG and private equity? If you just think about the definition of private equity, it's long-term investments in non-publicly traded companies. So two points here. The first one is long-term investments. So the um, private equity sponsor is really there for the long term. He is not there for two months. He has the time to actually influence the corporation and um, set the strategy. It's also non-publicly traded companies. And these non-publicly traded companies have the advantage that there was less disclosure, perhaps less awareness of ESG. And so there's just much more room to improve. Um, so increase the value of owned firms by actively influencing its strategic direction. So private equity sponsors are not just um, people who give money, but they really want to have a say. They want to influence the corporation. And so they're uniquely positioned to, to have an impact if they choose to do so. And finally, and I really want to stress this, the G, the governance of ESNG, of environmental, social, and governance, I mean, that has been part of the PE business model from day one. So um, it's really quintessential, if you want, um, for the business model of private equity. So they have a lot of experience in this. Now, if we think about the typical organizational form of a private equity fund, the 10-year limited partnership, um, I would just argue that this is perhaps both a blessing and a curse for ESG and private equity. So first, perhaps, why it is a blessing. So we have the general partner. The general partner has lots of discretion which portfolio companies to invest in. So he does not have to have a well-diversified portfolio where he needs to hold all the securities in an index. No, he can choose which companies to invest in. He can set a strategy. And that's just very exciting. If you have um, an ESG vision, then you can actually implement it. Lots of, um, lots of discretion. Um, why is perhaps um, the organizational form of limited partnership a challenge? Well, if we look at this picture, we see that the investors are really removed from the entrepreneurs. So there is the fund and the general partner in the middle. So investors have relatively little say about which companies um, are being invested in. The, the second thing that really makes this a challenge is this 10-year um, life, or extendable to 13-year if you want, um, because sooner or later the general partner will need to work on his track record. And what is the, if you think about your own business and, and, and your own choice when you think about private equity, what is the number one criterion when you choose which fund to invest in? It is going to be track record in forms of internal rate of return, in terms of value multiple. And then this is really something that becomes very important. And then if ESG goals do not necessarily coincide 
with the goals of maximizing the internal rate of return to raise your follow-on fund, this might, be, um, this might be much more challenging or more complicated. Now, despite this um, limited partnership and investors being removed from, from the entrepreneurs, um, of course, um, limited partnership agreements can do a little bit. Right? So here I just have an exclusion from a typical limited partnership agreement. The manager will not make an investment on behalf of the partnership in any entity, which to its knowledge is focused up on operating in the tobacco industry, gambling services, waste incineration. So you can have these exclusion filters in the limited partnership agreements to at least restrict a little bit and to avoid industries that you have very strong feelings against. However, um, these LPAs or these restrictions that you can put are also quite general. Why? Well, you need a common denominator across many limited partners. And if the limited partners want different things in terms of ESNG, then it might be the smallest common denominator. Also, these days, um, everybody wants to be in the very best funds um, because we think that there is um, a correlation between the performance in the first and the second and the third fund. And so if you are an LP and have very strong convictions and want very restrictive terms, you may not get into a fund that is oversubscribed because the general partner says, like, look, I mean, I have so many LPs that I can choose from. I, I cannot accommodate all of your, all of your restrictions. And finally, and, and, and this is something, just think back 10 years. Okay? So we didn't talk that much about um, ESNG 10 years ago. So what for a limited partner if your ESNG philosophy has changed, um, you cannot update the limited partnership agreement. Right? So this was a little bit to set the stage. Um, lots of potential um, for um, ESNG in private equity just because of the type of business model of the influence that the general partners can have but also some concerns about track record just being an incredibly important metric for um, the general partners to succeed in the, in the business. Good. So having said this, I want to really give you um, now an overview of a couple of recent academic papers. The first one, the first two papers that I'm going to present you are where ESG maximization is just coinciding with shareholder value maximization. So here's a paper that, that I really like. Um, does private equity ownership improve sanitary conditions? So what's the stage here? We have a Shai Bernstein and Sheen from Harvard on fast food chains. So we're looking at operational changes in restaurant chain buyouts using health inspection records for more than 50,000 fast food restaurants. So what do we see here? Um, in the US, if you've ever gone um, in, in the US to a restaurant, you see in the front window very prominently displayed A, B, and C, a grade for how um, the sanitary conditions of this restaurant are. And um, these sanitary um, conditions is something that we have data on that we can observe. And what I really like about this paper here is that they put a lot of thought into the question of whether we can disentangle whether private equity is just incredibly clever in choosing targets that um, are just better run, or whether they really have an influence on the companies. So here you have a picture of a typical road leading into um, a medium-sized uh, city in the US, and you see that you have plenty of um, fast food chains on the left and on the right side. And these fast food chains, of course, they work with a franchise system, so you might be able to buy 25 um, pizza huts um, in this particular city or geographic area. And then what Bernstein and Sheen do is they look at these, um, at these companies and say, well, suppose Pizza Hut and Arby's just above Route 40 um, are being owned by private equity, and KFC, Wendy's, and White Castle below are not owned by private equity. So after the private equity um, investor comes in, um, do we see differential changes in the sanitary conditions at these companies? And I really want to, to mention this because this is a big challenge in private equity um, to show that there is a causal impact. So the private equity company changes something um, at the um, portfolio companies. And any good study would put some thought into having a proper control group. And you'll see this in many of the studies that I'm, I'm going to show you. So what's happening here? We um, have two different types of violations, if you want. 
critical violations and non-critical violations of um, sanitary conditions. And you see here that after the buyout, the non-critical violations stay roughly the same, but these critical violations, they go down quite a bit over the four years after the buyout. And so these restaurants, after the private equity owner comes in, become cleaner, safer, and better maintained. And that's particular when private equity partners have prior industry experience. So they have this operational engineering um, aspect here. They know what they are doing. And why do they do this? Well, because, of course, it's good for business. If you have less critical um, health violations, people come to your restaurant. It's flourishing much more. And so fairly convincing results. The second study that I wanted to show you is about the oil and gas industry. So Bellin, um, in, in 2020 in Wharton, has written a nice paper where he looks at projects in the oil and gas industry. Some are private equity backed. And um, again, this idea, how can I make sure that I control for lots of things? He has satellite imaging and can then look at oil fields and say, this one is um, controlled by private equity, and the one right next to it is not. And so the soil conditions might be the same, um, and so on and so forth. So you can control for lots of things that you would want to control for. And here, again, you can see in this picture, we have the buyout with the um, dashed red line. And you can see that the private equity-owned um, um, fields or these firms, they use much less um, toxic chemicals in the three years or so after the um, private equity company has carried out the buyout. And again, why, why would you want to do this? Um, well, this is very good um, for business because after a while, private equity sponsors want to get out. It is much easier to sell um, these fields if you have used less toxic chemicals and if there is um, less chemicals in the soil. So again, these, these, these two papers here show you that private equity ownership um, can do a lot of things for ESG if it coincides with shareholder value maximization. Now, two other papers um, I want to present you look at ESG maximization, where this not necessarily is only shareholder value maximization, but where ESG will mean other stakeholders, other participants um, that, are, um, that are related to the portfolio firms. Okay. So the first one is about private equity investments in healthcare, um, in healthcare. So we look at nursing homes, nursing homes where elderly people go if they um, become too sick to live at home. And these nursing homes in the US is not just elder care, but it's also to kind of help you recover. So this is work by, recent work by Gupta, Gupta, Howell, and Yanellis, who are in Wharton, NYU, and Chicago. And they make an interesting point, I think, because healthcare is interesting here uh, for a couple of reasons. One is um, you may not necessarily, as an older person, be able to assess the provider quality. This is a product, if you want, that we typically choose once. We only go once to a nursing home. And the next point is that you often choose something in your proximity. So um, it's kind of much less restricted the choice that you have. And then, of course, we have the government agencies here that um, often pay. So it's not the patients directly who pay, but they are government agencies, subsidies, and regulations. So they look at 15,000 nursing homes. Um, and this is um, what you see. Um, the aggregate quality and staffing outcomes. So I think that, is, um, that these are the two key figures from this paper. On the, on the top figure, you see the overall rating. So how good is the nursing home? You, the red dashed line, again, is the private equity buyout. And you see that the overall rating um, is actually going down. In the bottom part, you see the um, nurse assistance per patient day. So how many qualified nurses do you have in the, um, in the um, nursing homes after the private equity buyout? And what you see here is that the staff, the qualified nurses that are in these, um, in these homes actually goes down. And so the, the author somewhat provocatively then um, estimate that over the entire sample period and across all of these, um, all of these nursing homes, um, private equity killed 20,150 people. So that's perhaps a bit too provocative. But what we can see here is that 
these nursing homes operate more efficiently. Um, it's probably good for business, but it is not so clear whether it is really good for the S and social, for the patients that are in these nursing, nursing homes. Um, similarly, um, we have data on private equity ownership of higher education institutions. So Eaton, Howell, and Yanellis look at roughly 1,000 private equity-owned higher education institutions. So what do you see here in the picture? You see four figures. The two figures on the left are the private equity tar targets and then the plus match placebos. These are just the appropriately chosen higher education institutions that are very similar but are not owned by private equity. And so if you concentrate on these two figures on the left, you can see that private equity sponsors increase tuition quite a bit. Um, and this doesn't happen in the placebo group. The two pictures on the right show you the fraction of students who start who then actually graduate. And what you can see again in this placebo group, there's not much change across the um, time of the buyout. But um, the third picture here, you can see that the private equity sponsor actually those institutions that are owned by private equity sponsors, graduation rates drop. And what's the conclusion of these authors? Um, well, the private equity-owned schools are just very good at capturing government aids, getting people into college. Um, there's government aid who helps you pay for it. So the, the tuition increase can potentially uh, maximize returns. But you also get some people into college who will then drop out, and that's probably not the most efficient use of their time. And so I wanted to give you these two examples for, um, for papers where we see that the value maximization, shareholder value maximization, may not necessarily coincide with ES and G maximization, and that there might be um, a bit more issues um, that can potentially arise. Now, the, the last paper that, that I wanted to show you is, um, a, I think, quite an interesting paper because it shows to me that ESG reporting is just so multidimensional, so it's difficult to get it right. So what's the paper about? We have private equity ownership um, of French companies. And Fun, Goldman, and Roulet, um, all from INSEAD, show that after an LBO, French target firms experience a reduction in the gender pay gap, together with an increase in, probability, in profitability. And so that's quite wonderful. We pay men and women um, more the same, and on, in addition, it increases the profit, profitability of corporations. And so, victory. The wage difference between men and women is reduced by quite a significant 6.5%. But then you go a little bit deeper into the paper and you see the following. Um, here we have always kind of a change in the hourly wage of these, um, of these um, corporations. Um, in, of, the, of the different types of entities. So the first two pictures show you the wage, the hourly wage of men and women. And these little bars, the horizontal bars that you see, is kind of is essentially showing you whether this is a, a, a change that is significant. And what you see from these two top panels is that men are actually being paid much less after the private equity um, buyout but that the pay for women stays more or less the same. Now, this still reduces the wage gap, but perhaps not how we would have anticipated it. Then digging deeper into the paper, we can look at managers and non-managers. So those that have high-level functions in the corporations and those that don't have high-level functions. And you can see that the hourly wage here of the managers drops much more than the hourly wage of the non-managers. And then finally, we have the last two panels at the bottom where we are looking at seniority. And so here we are looking at the employees aged over 50. And so it's there where the hourly wage decreases dramatically. And for the younger employees, not much changes. So if you take all of this together, what do we learn? We learn that the wage gap is being reduced in these portfolio companies because the private equity managers um, fire senior managers who happen to be male and happen to be, make, happen to be making a lot of money. So yes, we reduced the gender, gender, um, the gender um, wage gap, but you could also say oh, we are firing 
a lot of 50, 55, 60-year-old people who will have lots of trouble finding a new job that is as well paid and as, um, as good as the job that they have. And so if you then aggregate the, all of this into one ESG score, how many ESG points does this actually merit? Voila. Those were um, the um, couple of papers that I wanted to present to you. Recent things that have happened in private equity and ESG. We are living not in an ivory tower in our academic world. We think about the same questions that practitioners think about. And I'm delighted now to discuss some of these issues with um, Yegor from Substance Over Form. Hello, Yegor. Thank you for the invitation. It was a great presentation. Th th thanks a lot, Diego. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit just um, what, what you're doing when you're not participating in conferences. <laughs> so you're right in saying that that's not the only thing I'm doing. Um, um, at SOF, we're focused on risk regulations and, um, um, and reporting for alternative investments. So ESG obviously is an important um, um, part of, of, of those services. And uh, on top of that, I'm working in a couple of uh, working groups on the um, Germany and EU level for risk and reporting, as well as um, at the University of Oldenburg, um, where we offer um, alternative investment certificates. Thanks. When, when Jäger and I talked um, to, to, prepare, um, to prepare our discussion, he, he mentioned something that, that spoke to me a lot. And he said, like, there's really two types of ESNG. There is um, Risk management ESNG and impact ESNG. Um, can, can you elaborate a little bit on this, Diego? Sure. I think um, now, now that I've actually uh, listened to your presentation, I think it actually covers uh, what, you've, what you've just covered. So one thing is, um, as you said, is the, the risk and performance or the financial aspect of um, ESG. So the risk aspect means um, I invest somewhere and I do not want to lose money. So for instance, uh, there is a, um, a big scandal in terms of uh, bribery, so basically a G risk uh, um, um, getting getting real, and uh, I would I would like to avoid it. Mm -hmm. So this has nothing to do with uh, good or bad uh, uh, an impact on the environment or society. It only has something to do with the euros, so with the, with the market value of your investment. This I would say is the like you said shareholder value, or um, the, the the performance risk uh, dimension. The other dimension is uh, basically um, disconnected from the euros or from the financial performance. And it really has only something to do with, is it actually better for the stakeholders, meaning the environment and or the society? And an example would be that, um, again, if you, uh, for instance, um, if you have any uh, sort of CO2 emissions, um, um, then um, obviously it might uh, have a negative impact on the environment, whereas it might not necessarily immediately impact your financial value. So those are, I think, the two different dimensions that we always need to distinguish in the discussion um, about, about any, any type of ESG we're talking about. Thanks, Yegor. Um, you talk to a lot of limited partners, institutional investors. Which of these two types of ESNG do they, do they want? Well, I think that the first type, meaning the risk management, is obviously already integrated in the processes. So uh, there is absolutely no doubt that all of them uh, would like to, to identify and manage material risks, either it's uh, ESG related or not, with regard to the investment. So I think ESG risk management, as long as it is material, is absolutely something which, which all of them would like to have. With regard to the topic impact, this is something what I guess is becoming more and more important, uh, given that um, if you think, for instance, about an LP, so if you think about um, an insurance company or a pension fund, what they will do is they will offer the investments they're making also to their, in, uh, to, to their policyholders or to their banking clients, if you think about a bank. And I think the awareness for doing something good is raising as well. So all of a sudden, they have the pressure from the clients on their end, so from policyholders, from uh, beneficiaries, from um, uh, banking clients, which in turn expect them to provide them with impact products. So I think the impact dimension is also raising um, and will definitely raise over time due to all the, let's say, awareness also in the media. 
uh, but the risk component is definitely something which which, which has been um, yeah, uh, present, let's say, and important uh, for many years, regardless of regulations, regardless of media. So this is something what is a core of, of any investment and risk management process already. Mm. Now that, that's very interesting. And perhaps just, just coming back to this, um, the example that I gave of the private equity industry and restaurant chains. So 10 mm -hmm. years ago, the private equity company would have, um, would have just said, while we are doing operational engineering, we have senior executives who know the industry very well, and we are maximizing the value for, the, um, for our shareholders or for our, in, in, for our investors. And now the private equity guy says, are we really concerned about ESNG? And look how we made the restaurants better, healthier, um, and um, overall increased environmental, social, and governance. Is this just boilerplate or, or whitewashing? What, what do you think about that? Um, it, it, it depends a little bit, again, what we are talking about. I think um, that, um, as you said, if you have a restaurant and as a manager you make sure that the restaurant is in a better condition, it's cleaner, uh, the food is better, uh, then you do this obviously in, in the first place because you would like to not to lose return and or to maximize your performance in the first place, right? So because obviously it's probably more... Uh, uh, more difficult to sell a dirty instrument, uh, sorry, a, a dirty restaurant uh, uh, than, than a clean uh, restaurant. So I guess that's, uh, that's, that's one point. So I think, the, the, um, like you said, the, the increase of the operational performance, which is ESG related, is, um, has been done already for years uh, and is, is in the nature of the investment and the risk process. So this is nothing, nothing uh, new. Uh, now they start calling this um, ESG um, because, first of all, it's good for the marketing, but also it's, it's what the regulatory uh, uh, bodies uh, require you to do. Um, and I think there is nothing wrong with that because at the end of the day, this is ESG risk management. So it's not really, I wouldn't call it a boilerplate. I would say this is, this is an ESG risk management, but it's not necessarily something new. I think a different uh, situation is when you have your restaurant and all of a sudden you do something not because of your financial return, but because you really want to have a better impact. So for instance, if you improve the working condition of um, or the salaries, let's say, of your employees in this restaurant, um, and it doesn't necessarily have any impact on the exit multiple later, but you still do it because you think it's good for them, uh, then obviously it's an impact dimension, which again, um, I guess not every uh, PE manager will do right now uh, or, or later. So again, here, I think we need to distinguish and uh, the first component risk is definitely something what has been done already uh, and is definitely ESG. The second component, I guess, is a bit more niche, but it's getting more and more mainstream right now as well. Uh, and it's also ESG. So uh, yes and no at the same time. That's, I think, the complexity of ESG. No, I, I, I agree with you there. So let's perhaps then talk about this, this impact part that you were, that you were mentioning. I guess there, it just is so important that you come up with an equivalent measure to say the IRR or value multiple. And so when, when you talk to limited partners and they say, look, I want ESG reporting, can you tell us a little bit about what would best in class look like for private equity investments? Oh yes, so that, that, that's, that's definitely not an easy uh, question, Rüdiger. And, and I guess we're not the only ones uh, trying to answer it. So. I guess there is no such thing as an, an, an IRR for impact for a simple reason that um, the, uh, the, the topics E, S, and G are very, very different and not related to each other. So I think you said something like, like a gender, gender pay gap um, in your presentation, but then also something uh, like uh, CO2 emissions. So I think it's clear that you cannot really combine the CO2 emissions where you have a unit of um, CO2 tonne equivalence and the gender pay gap, where you have a unit um, as a percentage, you can't really aggregate it in a simple way, uh, like you would do with IRR, where you have financial metrics and you have euros and uh, discounted cash flows, which is quite quite easy from the let's say method um, uh, methodology. Um, so therefore, I wouldn't say that there is the unique or will be a unique metric for saying is it a uh, uh, this is the IRR for for ESG. But there will be definitely, and there are already definitely some standards um, that regulatory bodies are trying to establish. To name the biggest one is definitely the EU taxonomy, 
which is basically telling you green, what is green, what is not green, based on a, a heavy set of standards. And they're working on this right now in the EU, um, where they try to define, uh, let's say, a green dictionary, and which, which will tell you, obviously, is it, uh, is it a good impact or not. Um, at the same time, they're working on um, a couple of KPIs, which are also very, very different. And there is not, uh, there is no best KPI. They just, there are just multiple KPIs that are all very different, which are called principal adverse impact KPIs. So basically, bad KPIs, things that make a bad impact on something. And um, again, here, this this also will lead to a, to a deg certain degree of a standardization, but not in terms of you know one one KPI. This will be the master KPI for all for, for all others, but more as a set of different KPIs trying to capture different aspects. So then we are going in a direction where investments are going to be more and more focused because this is just so multidimensional that I will have super specialized funds that then will look at just one of these KPIs and try to do this really well. Um, is, is that what you think an impact investment is going to happen? Uh, that would be definitely easier from the GP perspective to set up a fund where you basically trigger one KPI so let's say uh, low CO2 emissions, as an example. Uh, because then obviously you, you have a very narrow investment strategy. Uh, you have a very, let's say, slim process where you just need to monitor one KPI. And it's also very easy to communicate. So if you go to an investor and you say, you know, I decrease my CO2 compared to um, something else, so compared to some benchmark to the industry, for example, everyone understands it straight away. So I guess with that regard, you're right. Um, that uh, it's definitely something what is easier to have a narrow strategy. Um, on the other hand side, um, there are also GPs who see it as an opportunity to say, okay, um, I could say that um, um, I could define, let's say, a very abstract KPA, KPI on top where I say, let's say 80% of my fund are making a substantial positive contribution, so are sustainable. And then if you would like to see if your investment is sustainable or not, then you can apply different KPIs for a different investment. So for instance, for a restaurant change, a chain, you would apply one KPI. For, um, for an energy asset, you would apply another KPI. But then you would aggregate them as a sustainable, um, um, sustainable investment, let's say, or a positive contribution. So I guess this, this is also something what we see. However, of course, this is more difficult to communicate because at the end of the day, you need to go deep and say, okay, but what exactly is sustainable? Which KPIs are you using? Which goals are you trying to trigger? So of course, the, the, the more um, heterogeneous you are in your, uh, and less focused, the more difficult it is in the process, but also in the marketing communication of this. Yeah. So, so let me ask you an impossible question. Um, the, last, um, the last paper that I presented um, about reducing the gender pay gap by firing senior managers. Um, how nuanced, is there any ESG report that would be nuanced enough to capture both of these aspects? And what, like you said, you combine different KPIs. What's the, what's the overall score for this private equity fund? Uh, well, it, um, yeah. obviously, if you would like to measure the impact, um, um, again, there will be not one single KPI to do that. Um, and uh, basically, to be honest, it's also the same, the same applies to our financial uh, metrics, where uh, IRR is, not, is also not the one and only number. You also have a lot of multiples and many, many other metrics you're also looking at when assessing a fund. So the same applies, I guess, to impact. And um, with regard to what you're saying, I think it would be a bit of, uh, um, of a narrow approach to just take uh, a, a gender pay gap um, as, a, as, as, as the only KPI to measure, let's say, the social contribution. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I guess you would introduce, if you would like to really measure the social dimension, you would introduce multiple KPIs and see how they perform in relation to each other. So for instance, what you were saying, you're, you're firing senior managers, which by the way happens a lot in, um, um, in big companies uh, after senior managers reach a certain age. Uh, and a certain salary, um, then maybe uh, you would like to introduce an additional KPI saying a fluctuation or um, a, a sort of, um, 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 let's say, firing, uh, firing of, um, of, of, senior, of senior staff or ge generally fluctuation of the company. And then, you know, your, your gender pay gap would increase, uh, uh, sorry, decrease, uh, but the other KPI would, um, uh, would increase. And then you would see that, okay, um, 
maybe this is how I can explain that the first uh, KPI perform, performs better. And then at the end, you, you, would, you would have to make uh, um, a conclusion what that actually means. So at the end of the day, you need to look at multiple KPIs and see what they're actually trying to tell you, mm -hmm. rather than just focusing on one. Mm -hmm. No, no, thank you. This is very helpful. I guess when we talked um, be, be, before today, um, you told me that one thing that is on the mind of everybody right now is the SFDR. Um, and so I think we have a, prepared a slide for this, um, so we can show it here. Um, why don't you take a couple of minutes here and explain what the SFDR does and what, what this slide, this is a slide that you have prepared, what you want to say to us with this slide? Right, so uh, the SFDR, uh, for those who are not uh, familiar with that, um, is a disclosure regulation. So it's not, it, it basically forces um, LPs and GPs to disclose different aspects of, of ESG on the um, entity and product level. And um, there are basically three dimensions, as you can see here. The left one we discussed uh, is the risk dimension, so not losing money is what I said at the beginning. Um, we invest into an asset and then some ESG event occurs. So, for example, there is a big um, a bribery. Uh, so an example would be uh, Wirecard, for example, right, uh, which, which was listed, but still it's, 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 I think it's very prominent in our heads. So imagine you invest into Wirecard when the, when the value is high. Then you didn't see that Financial Times was publishing the whole times um, that uh, uh, something might be wrong there with their uh, balance sheets, um, and then you ignore that, and then you lose all your money because uh, all of a sudden they found that uh, uh, two millions in cash don't exist uh, on the balance sheet, right? So, uh, um, but then it's too late, and that's exactly what is uh, what is happening in this first box uh, where you try to not to lose your money, um, and this is what you, what the SFDR wants everyone to disclose. The second one, you see the negative impact. You see that the, the earth where we live is, uh, is, is unhappy, is dirty, uh, is spoiled. So, uh, um, or polluted, better to say. Um, what uh, it is about is that whatever you do, you do not cause any negative, negative impact on the society, society and the environment. And um, that's where I said where the regulator, regulator defines um, a concept of a principal adverse impact KPI, so-called PIs. Um, we, we should measure this negative impact, but also the so-called do not significant harm assessment, DNSH, where you also have to uh, define KPIs and measure if there is any significant harm. And then last but not least, the positive impact is the right one. You see the happy earth. So this is where you not just avoid negative impact, but you really create, uh, as you said, shareholder, um, uh, sorry, stakeholder, stakeholder value. So you basically make the earth and the society happy, um, uh, regardless of the financial impact. And um, that, is, that is something where we will have uh, now uh, different types of products. We'll have an Article 9 product, which is the, the dark green product, which has a high sustainable impact. You'll have Article 8 products, which will be uh, an, an, a light green product, so the, the requirements for, for positive impact are less. And then you have an Article 6 product which just manages ESG risks, but not, uh, is not doing any, it is not contributing to any positive impact. So there will also have some labeling now in the EU area. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you were to take these three different areas and would have to take a typical institutional investor and to say a pension fund, an endowment, a family office, and ascribe them to the category one, two, and three, where where would I put those? What would be a typical investor interested in these different ideas? Can you say that? Yes. So, mm -hmm. so I think uh, uh, um, the, those investors who um, have some clients in the background, uh, especially retail clients, like I said, such as policyholders of uh, life insurance, uh, unit linked uh, life insurance um, companies, um, such as um, uh, uh, bank, uh, 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 bank clients who, who provide uh, their funds to the bank and buy investment products for the bank, from the bank and so on. Those, those LPs who have this sort of clients themselves will have to ask now under certain regulations such as IDD or MIFID, they have to go to the investor, to the private investor and ask him, would you like to make a sustainable investment? So they go to, uh, to you, would you go and ask you, would you like to, to make a positive impact with your investment? And I assume that you would say, yes, why not? I, this is something what is definitely not a, not a bad thing to do, right? So 
once you say this, so once you say this, you basically execute pressure. You put pressure on your on your service provider, so the bank or the insurance company. And that means for them in turn that they need to go to the GP and basically get the same from them. So they will need from them uh, impact, impact funds because this is the only way they can satisfy the, satisfy the demand of their, uh, of their clients. So once, once we get those clients who are exposed to the, to the, to the retail market, which, which is now more and more impact driven, those clients will be interested in impact products. Other clients uh, might be less interested in it just because the pressure is not that high there. So I think the, 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 the key driver for this impact dimension is, first of all, the market, so the, the client, basically, the client itself. Uh, and second, the regulation, because the regulator obviously also forces you to disclose everything you do now in terms of ESG. Thanks, thanks a lot, Yegor. Um, these were nice closing words. Our time for our discussions is up. Thanks, thanks a lot. This was fun. And I'll pass, the, I'll pass the word back to Emanuele. Thank you, Rudy. So, very interesting talk. Uh, so, we continue, and uh, now let's turn to our third speaker on the ESG, Johanna Castro. So, Johanna is principal with the private equity team uh, at Unigestion, where she is uh, head of private investment. Uh, before she joined Unigestion, she started a career at Goldman Sachs in investment banking in 2007, nice year to start. In 2010, she joined the European Bank for Construction and Development uh, as senior analyst focusing on private equity funds and became principal afterwards. Uh, so uh, the talk of Joanna, titled The Best of the Worst Place to Make a True Impact, will dig further on, I think, the practicalities of EAG. So it's a nice complement with respect to the previous talk. And I think there will be a lot on how to score, use that for risk measurement, and also the link with respect to the materiality of ESG for performance. Joanna, please join. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I would like to spend the next 15 minutes addressing the points that have been already discussed this morning by Professor Fallenbach and also in the discussion with, with Jaeger. Um, so I hope I can provide you the answer by the end of this session on how private equity is the best or the worst place to make a true impact. Before um, I deep dive on, um, on the topic, I just want to make a brief intro on Unigestion. We are a global specialist asset manager that is uh, based in Geneva with a global presence, has tw over 22 billion under management, and we are um, really focused on research and innovation, and therefore very pleased to be here at this conference. In private equity, we have been investing for over 30 years. So we have a dedicated team of over 50 people really focusing on the sm small end of the mid-market. We uh, have a thematic focused investing, which um, we are uh, really uh, looking for attractive investment teams based on the research efforts that we continuously do at the firm. Our ESG journey has started actually 17 years ago. So in our equity businesses, we started in 2004, and in private equity, we have our first ESG product called ETO's Environmental Sustainability back in 2010. This means that our ESG journey has really been strengthened by a continuous um, improvement and the recent SFDR uh, uh, regulation that Jaeger just spoke about has been a good example of that. Unigestion is complying with Article 3, 6 and 5. We have a P fund uh, with a direct focus on, that is an Article 8 fund. We will launch later this year a fund with focus on climate change that will be Article 9, and we also be compliant with the principal adverse impacts indicators that Jaeger also mentioned from 2022. So, as you know, private equity, in private equity market, ESG is a big topic at the moment. So, I would like to spend the next few minutes to look at on how private equity firms are looking at ESG at the moment. So, according to a survey that was done with over 200 private equity firms, mostly in Europe, uh, we have, as you can see in the, in, in, on this slide, 
ESG being front of mind for many of private equity players. All the areas of ESG that go from decision making to reporting are actually taking a lot of attention of PE firms as of today. Very interestingly, two thirds of the respondents of this uh, survey have said that value creation is the key reason why they do responsible investing, which is very interesting and, and contrasts with other answers uh, like we were saying before about value preservation or uh, reputational risks. However, you can uh, clearly say that there's also a big gap between talk and action. And this slide is a great example of that. While there are topics like uh, health and safety or prevention of, of bribery and corruption that have a very little gap between uh, talk and action, others like climate risk, carbon footprint still have a quite wide gap. So, the main reason, in our view, why that, re that gap persists, it's actually driven by the, the, the ability of responsible investing to drive returns. So at Unigestion, we believe that responsible investing can actually deliver solid returns. And I would like to share with you a real life example that we manage at, at, at Unigestion. So this chart compares uh, ESGP portfolio managed by Unigestion versus the, uh, the equity index MSCI world. So we have managed this portfolio since 2014 and are very pleased with the strong performance to date. We believe that this portfolio will be among one of our best performing portfolios in private, equ in private equity. Out of that portfolio and within our ESG exposure in private equity, I decided I would select two ESG winners to present to you here today. On the left hand side, we have an electric vehicles charging network that was recently listed in the US market. And on the right hand side, we have an operator of solar energy generation projects, the second largest in its country, that has been sold to one of the leading players in infrastructure and has generated close to three times returns to our investor. The business of the EV charging network, it was the best performing investment in all ingestion portfolios last year, having currently uh, being marked at 15 times our investment. So really impressive to see the, the, the potential and, and return generation of these transactions. So, you may be wondering, so how do we um, do responsible investing at Unigestion? So our approach is the result of the long-standing experience I showed to you briefly, and also a continuous learning curve. I would say that it's very important for us to be focused on these four key pillars. The first two pillars are about exclusions and about restricting our investment universe from the moment we source new opportunities. Then pillar three, the ESG guidelines, is about controlling the ESG matters in the investments we have decided to make, to make sure that they are always at high standards during our ownership. Lastly, but very importantly, pillar four is about how we drive change in the investments during our ownership. In, the f in, 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 in Unigestion, we are generally very proud of the high ratings we have been receiving from relevant third parties, but we continue to, to remain committed to improve our, on our process. In the following slides, I will walk you through how ESG integration is implemented in our investment process, from sourcing to due diligence to portfolio management. So here you have uh, two good examples on how uh, we have positive contribution via the investments we put in our portfolio. So Jaeger has mentioned to you about SFDR. Article 8 is basically the, 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 the categorization that we have for these funds of direct investments. And concretely, with what that does mean for us is that all, most of the investments that we put in this portfolio of direct, of direct fund are contributing to at least one of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So here you have two good examples. I will go through that in a second. But before, I just wanted to highlight that for us at Unigestion, the materiality on how we contribute to those SDGs are very important. 
And so we ensure that the investments we make have at least 75% of their revenues to can positively contribute to these SDGs. In addition, we also take a very strict approach on how we establish the link between the SDG and the, 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 activity of, the economic activity of the company. Important to say that we did not change the investment strategy of our direct fund to meet these um, SFDR criteria. We had already a portfolio of 10 investments that were done before the SFDR got uh, into place. And so this is actually driven because our investment pr approach focus on investment teams that already are aligned with SDGs. So as a result for us, it was a very natural transition. So on the left-hand side, uh, we, are, we have a US-based company that manufactures speciality components used in uh, medical devices. Those medical devices are typically used for minimal invasive procedures and they benefit people that have several conditions around orthopedics, cardiovascular and neurovascular. As a result, we see a clear link that it's also uh, claimed by research that this investment will have a clear contribution to SDG3, good health and well-being. Then, if we look on the, on the right-hand side, we have basically the goal uh, of sustainable, sustainable cities and communities. The investment we have made on this Swiss company, which is a R&D lead, lead, leader in optical sensors, is a clear example on how you can contribute to SDG 13, 11. Sorry. And the reason being is that this company pro manufactures the optical sensors that go in ele elevators, escalators, automated doors. And those contribute not only for high safety standards, but also to energy efficiency of commercial buildings and also housing. So here are just two examples that I thought I would bring your attention today. But within our portfolio, we also cover other SDGs like climate inaction, for example, SDG 13, and, 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 and others um, within really the same approach and framework that I explained to you just now. The next uh, topic uh, that is also very important for our ESG integration is about ESG risk assessment and financial impact. And Jaeger um, has already alluded to that, and as part of the presentation of, of Professor Rudy, he also alluded to how important is risk mitigation uh, in relation to ESG. So here we have a concrete example of a company that we, we looked at, we identify the key SG risks and we measure it because that's not, not only um, uh, key importance for us and ingestion, but also as we discussed for the regulator as part of the SFDR policy. So this was a company that was produ producing natural ingredients that were derived from grapes. It was a great business from a circular economy perspective because they were using waste that was kind of derived from the usage of grapes converting that waste is in natural ingredients and as part of their production process, the only byproduct that they had was actually water. What they would do with that water afterwards was actually to irrigate the fields around the plant. So you have really a zero waste process during your um, uh, production process, which is really great in terms of the circular economy. When we start looking at this investment, we start thinking, okay, so what are the really yes, key yes, material ESG risks that can put that uh, value at risk for our investments? And so we came, we, came, uh, with three, we came with three key criteria to assess that. One is basically driven by um, the fact that this company uses raw materials being grapes. So climate risk is going to be at front of mind here. On one side, anything that can be caused by natural catastrophes, so acute climate risk, but also um, the global warming that will clearly have an impact or on how the harvesting of the grapes can be done. Thirdly, there was also a, a point that a small portion of this portfolio or, or the portfolio of products of these companies were actually uh, coming from natural alcohols because the, the production that you would do of the waste of the grapes would, would allow you to produce natural alcohols that the company was still making some, some money on. So we decided to stress test our financial model on the basis of these three ESG risks that we, that we see on the slide. So you have two scenarios. Uh, one scenario was what would be the impact should all these three risks materialize? And the second scenario was 
what would be the impact should there be global warming during the ownership of the investment. As you can see from the, the snapshot of the model, EBITDA of the company would be the most impacted because you are going to have, as a result of that, impact not only on your revenues but also on your, on your costs should there be, for example, a tax applied to additive substances. And so in the end, when you look at the, your expected returns, initially that we were calculating to make 2.2 times our money, we could do have a material impact of, for example, uh, reducing it to 1.8. If we we're going to talk about only global warming, our assumptions were slightly more conservative. We we're looking again at impact at our revenue stream because we would have to adapt our production, but the impact would be slightly lower. Um, but still, clearly, ESG risk will have um, a financial impact for our returns and our investors' returns should they materialize. Then moving on to what other type of ESG due diligence do we do at Unigestion? At Unigestion, we are obsessed by data. And so we attribute a lot of value to our um, proprietary ESG scoring. And I guess here I try to summarize the key metrics we have been um, doing and measuring for all our investments across the firm. We have been implementing this ESG score for quite some, uh, some few years now, which means that we had to be realistic about the data that we were asking to people. We shouldn't forget that the challenge that is out there for private markets, particularly in the smaller end of the market where we focus, is really difficult to gather some of these key data. So at Unigestion, we have been focused on quality to ensure that we can have some measurements, not so much on quantity, and we expect now to evolve with the wave of the market. And we have been focused on data accuracy as well, to ensure that we could uh, really have meaningful results of this score. So the score is summarized on the right, uh, on right hand side, and that same radar you will be able to find that in our investment memos, pre-investment, and we will be reporting on that um, on an annual basis as well uh, to our investors. So we can track the evolution of that score during our ownership. The following slide shows you ESG scoring in action. So this is a sample of our direct portfolio where we, we, we are able to track and compare the several ESG scores. So here you can take uh, two key conclusions. One is that most of the, of the companies we have invested at are beginners or followers which means that you can clearly see there's a lot of improvement that they can do on environmental side. One quick note is that a lot of the business we may invest may not have environmental topics as top of the agenda. For example, a nurse, nursery platform may not consider that a key topic, but for example, can focus a lot on social and governance. We can see also that ESG processes are start coming into those companies, even though they are small. But generally, we see that we are investing in beginners and followers to, become, to make them to become leaders. The other point is that the fact that the scoring is not that high doesn't mean that we will immediately decline a deal. On the contrary, we look at that as an opportunity to engage and improve these companies further on E, S, and G. Talking about engagement, that leads me to my next topic, which are two examples that I selected from our portfolio on how private equity owners can influence and make positive impact. So here we have just two very concrete examples and the type of engagement we have done. So you have one that has been achieved on the left-hand side and the other one which focuses more on environmental topics on the right. Then, because you cannot improve it if you don't measure it, as the famous Coast, Coast uh, says, I just highlight one final point which is about ESG reporting. It's critical and it will continue to be uh, in the years to come. So to conclude, I hope you have enjoyed my presentation. The question is really uh, addressed here. In my view, private equity is the best place to make true impact. You have real influence. You have typically less complex business models. You have great room for improvement, as you can see. And all it takes is to have a strong ESG process. Thanks again. And I lead to Emmanuel. Okay, thank you, Joanna. Uh, very interesting. So now we, we move on the um, 
panel session, so I will pass over to Marie Lambert. Um, so before um, Marie uh, introduce uh, the speaker, let me uh, say a few words on, on Marie. Uh, so Marie is a professor and vice dean of uh, research at HEC Liège, um, and she holds uh, the Deloitte Share in Financial Management and Corporate Valuation. Uh, she's also an affiliate professor at Paris Dauphine, EDEC Business School and Research Associate also at EDEC. So, Marie, I will uh, pass to you. Uh, just before, uh, obviously, it will be very, very interesting to, 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 to hear the point about the panel on this uh, materiality of ESG and how to reconcile, in fact, the non pecuniary objective of ESG and uh, the return objective of the LPs. Uh, so the floor is yours, and uh, uh, as I said at the start, uh, the audience will have the possibility after the panel session uh, using the chat box to post questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Emmanuel. So we will follow now the insightful presentation that we, we got from uh, Rudy, uh, Yegor, and, and Johanna, which really merged the academic and the practitioner point of view on the state of the art of uh, ESG in private markets. And uh, in this session of 30 minutes, uh, we will first discuss the practicalities in the implementation of the ESG investment strategy. And, and for that, we have the great pleasure to uh, have with us six panelists. So let me introduce you briefly to the six panelists. So first, uh, we already heard uh, Joanna Castro, who is the principal within the private equity team and, and the head of primary investment and also responsible of uh, investment committee at uh, Unigestion. Uh, she has an extensive experience in uh, investment banking and, and private equity investment. Um, we have also Cyril De Maria, uh, who is an international expert and an advisor in private markets. He combines uh, really in-depth practical knowledge with an entrepreneurial background and academic expertise. He got his PhD from a, a Singalen. He's also an affiliate professor at EDEC, and he collaborates regularly as an expert with the European Commission. Uh, then we move to uh, Melissa Ferraz, who is uh, managing director and global head of eFront Insight uh, within BlackRock. So eFront Insight is a private markets data and an analytics platform. And Melissa is responsible for the overall strategy of Insight, as well as sales, customer success, data operation, product uh, engineering activities within the business. Uh, she's also a Juris Doctor from uh, Loy Loyola University, uh, Chicago. We have also the great pleasure to have Dorte Opner, uh, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Riverside Europe. Uh, she leads the, the firm of uh, investor relations and fundraising act, uh, initiatives within the European investor. And she also uh, leads the Riverside European ESG work. She has an extensive experience in communication, but also uh, in P and VC investment. She has been uh, heading for six years the German Private Equity and Venture Capital uh, Association as a managing director. Um, Paula Langton uh, is a partner at Campbell Leutens and uh, she co-heads uh, the firm placement activities uh, in Europe as well as the sustainability strategy of uh, Campbell Leutens. She has an extensive uh, experience in fund placement as she has led uh, well over 30 fundraising uh, for European and global private equity uh, firms. Last but not least, we have uh, Yegor uh, Tokaveric. Uh, we, we already heard uh, um, it's this really insightful discussion with uh, Riff Rudy, is CEO, CEO of SOF. Uh, uh, which is a reporting service provider focusing on risk management and reporting, including ESG investment and regulated uh, in institutional uh, investor. And he's also the head of professional development program at the University of uh, Oldenburg. So thanks a lot to all our panelists. Um, I will um, start with um, maybe uh, making a link with the, the different presentation we had because a long-standing claim has been that uh, uh, private market can 
contrary to public market, can really focus on long-term achievement and public market might be more focused on the on short-term one. Uh, but still there is a contrast in the, liter the academic literature uh, on this uh, regard, which has been already highlighted by, by Rudy. So on the one hand, we have some uh, researcher that have shown that uh, private equity will provide a very positive impact on the profitability, maybe the safety, the growth, access to external finance for firms. And on the other hand, you have some anecdotal uh, evidence, but also research that shows some mixed impact on stakeholders, such as customer, uh, patient, employees. So to start with the debate, uh, my first question would be about uh, how to integrate ESG criteria into the investment process. Do you think it's compatible with private equity uh, manager financial performance objectives? So this is in line with the first question of Emmanuel. Um, so I will first uh, maybe ask to, to Paula to react on this. Sure, so um, I believe that returns and ESG implementation and objectives are, are completely compatible um, and arguably uh, companies are likely to be valued less or returns lower if ingredients aren't in place. We're raising about 14 billion worth of sustainability and impact funds and all of them have got have got market leading returns um, and in fact our clients with um, who aren't labeled as, as impact funds uh, those with the best ESG practices processes are actually the highest performing um, there is a correlation and we've seen that in um, in Joanna's data before that as well. Um, the question really, I suppose, is how, how private equity professionals are incentivized to, to drive ESG agenda um, and, spend, and spend the money. Um, and then also around the horizon. So, you know, arguably, um, if it's a shorter term horizon for a PE firm, um, do they get the same return on investment if they say if they spend the money? You know, are they incentivized to do so? I think in general, the vast majority of private equity firms um, have very good G, so it's all about the, the E and the S and how that's driven through and implemented. Um, you know, arguably with a longer term high time horizon, is there more time to, to implement? But I think that there are many firms out there that have now got the, um, the wherewithal and the practices in place to drive returns in a shorter time frame as well. Thanks a lot, Paula. I, I will make a follow-up of the presentation of uh, Joanna and ask a question to Joanna because you really highlighted the value creation uh, 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 of ESG in in this private market, but uh, uh, what do you do? You think that there is a potential conflict uh, between short term and and long term uh, objectives? So, have you had any thought on that? Or so, I think in my presentation, I try to show in a real life example that we have in our portfolio. Um, I wouldn't disagree then, and with what Professor Fallenbach has mentioned of some situations where you may have a conflict, but overall we are in a long-term industry where in the end you're, you have to maximize the value at your exit. And as Paula has mentioned before, there's a positive correlation. I don't expect that people that today won't, don't care about these topics when they are doing their value creation plan will be able to sell those businesses there's that successfully in five years time. If their horizon would be to do a quick flip and then make a kind of a very short, uh, a significant return in a short time frame, maybe, but in the long term game, ESG topics will be crucial to value um, your investments as high as possible at your exit. Thanks a lot. Um... I have a question also for, for Melissa. Um, so what are the incentive of the fund management towards uh, ESG as a value driver? So, and uh, have you any thought about the perception of the manager? Does it, uh, do you think it has changed over time? Certainly, I think, <clears throat> you know, several years ago, um, ESG reporting for a fund manager was a, really a tick the box exercise. Um, and to some extent, pure risk mitigation. And, and what we see from our clients in the LP community is really a strong desire to, um, to continue to see that shift towards alpha generation opportunities and long-term incentives like Paula was mentioning. And I think that um, largely speaking, most investors around the world have an expectation that there's um, proper, certainly proper governance, but also impact um, driven metrics that will result in longer term returns. And while there 
evaluating a fund manager, whether they're re-upping or whether they're um, looking to deploy a new mandate, ESG um, you know, criteria are certainly part of that evaluation process. Whereas before, I think it was certainly your returns stood for themselves and that wasn't really a component of, of what they would look at as long as the returns were, were strong. And that shift has certainly started to be made. Okay, I, I will ask the same question to, to Cyril. So with your uh, academic and uh, entrepreneurial and practical knowledge, so could you also react on this question and give uh, us your experience? Sure. Um, I think it's a little bit complicated at times. Um, for example, if we start to look at what venture does, uh, on paper, actually, it creates employment and it's supposed to be compliant with the governance dimension, which is quite important, but also with the environmental topics. Now, if we start to scratch the surface, it starts to raise very interesting questions. For example, is disruption ESG compliant? When you're investing in Uber, are you ESG compliant? Is cannabis investing, uh, which is a big industry in venture industry at the moment, uh, is it compliant with ESG? When you invest in dual use, that is to say in military and civil uh, uh, technologies, are you ESG compliant? So it, it's, it's quite a difficult topic to explore. And I think uh, even though the industry has been progressing, um, the topic has been on the table since the 70s. And, and I must say, we don't see so many, uh, let's say, advanced answer at the moment. Another thing that concerns me is that um, it, it costs money to actually perform an ESG uh, analysis. And the question is, do you get a reward for your additional cost? Asking private companies to do additional reporting is, is expensive. And um, so you create somehow maybe externalities, which might be positive, but might be negative as well. And the question is, did you spend your money wisely? And that's extremely difficult to measure. Thanks a lot. Um, maybe, Dorte, as you have a long experience in, a, in a investor relation in Europe, so if I ask you the same question and, uh, to, and maybe also some differences between the European and US market, we forgot to the perception of the, the manager, uh, could you share with us some, some insights? Yeah, right. I mean, the um, ESG is really something that uh, evolved in Europe and is now also arriving in the US. And I think, um, you know, since Biden took office, uh, clearly there are more regulatory and legislative um, initiatives to also implement ESG um, into the mindset um, of our um, of our colleagues in the US. And, and so while ESG has its roots in, in Europe and has really matured already in, in Europe, I think um, other regions of the world are catching up and, and so are also investors. So investors from across the world are now looking at, into ESG. Uh, but, but, but maybe if you allow me to also make, make one comment on, on what you asked um, just, uh, bef uh, just now, uh, that I, I, I think you know, ESG, if it, we all agree it's a value creation tool. And I think private equity managers, investment managers have realized that this is very much the case. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, um, and that they are aware that you need to have an ESG um, strategy in place and you need to watch out for ESG factors. So in a way, ESG is now being treated like any other value creation tool that the industry is using. It will become part of a regular due diligence, commercial due diligence, you know, right now you have maybe ESG due diligence and you call it ESG due diligence, but I bet in four to five years from now, it will be just a subset of the regular commercial due diligence. Just like you're checking out, you know, how is the sales team of a company set up? Do they have the right instruments in place to boost their sales? And, 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 and if, you know, using that as a value creation tool, uh, people and the industry, private equity industry, um, they will use ESG as a value creation tool. So, and, and so of course, you, you know, it becomes because you achieve higher multiples ultimately when you exit a company, if it is a strong ESG case, if it's a sustainable business and, and by, so, so the motivation in my view is, in my personal view is pretty clear. You know, if you can achieve higher multiples at the exit, it would be foolish uh, not to fully integrate ESG and also measure ESG. 
Thank you. I, I will also ask uh, to you, Paula, uh, uh, given your experience in fundraising and uh, your contact with investors. So, uh, what are the expectations right now of the of the investor? Has it also changed over time? If we think about, um, and I presume you mean expectations in terms of returns, but uh, I guess ultimately investors want want both returns. They want uh, they want returns and they want impact, um, and they want good ESG practice. Um, and ultimately, fiduciary duty dictates that they have to maximise returns for, for their shareholders. I think what's particularly interesting is how that translates in the future, where investors will need to ultimately rapidly decarbonise their portfolios. And um, we've seen that already through, through some of the UN initiatives. Um, and at which point in the future, you know, cl climate or impact might have to go above um, above returns, but but clearly there needs to be regulatory change or, or adjustment um, for, for that to happen. And, and actually, we are starting to see a couple of funds being raised, which is putting climate first. Um, and we're seeing more natural capital funds raised, which are attracting investors. But actually, the, the forefront investors in that are actually more the corporate balance sheets uh, for those that have got net zero objectives. So it'll be interesting to see how, how investors uh, follow that trend. Thanks. Before moving to, to the second topic of this panel, I have a last question for you, uh, Diego. You, you make a very clear summary of the current regulation uh, in Europe, and I wanted to, to ask you whether this regulation also helps into the transition, or is it a more support to it, or is it an incentive towards ESG? What is your thought on that? Well, uh, as always, you know, every, everything then uh, might, might have a good and a bad impact at the same time. So the same is with the, with the regulation. So I think what is definitely the case with a, a very ambitious and very, um, very let's say, uh, wide-reaching regulation is that everyone is talking about it now. There is no doubt. So I think if you think five, about five years ago, no one was talking really about ESG disclosures and different impacts uh, or different measures of ESG and so on. So if you look at the agendas of conferences, uh, you know, it, it was not such a big topic. It was more, let's say, a niche topic, in my opinion. Um, but if you look at it now, everyone is talking about it. And, and now you even have conferences just about this topic like this one here, for instance. And um, that shows that the regulation and the regulatory pressure definitely increases the motivation of people to... Uh, do something there because they must. Uh, they don't. Uh, maybe some of them don't even want to, but they must do something. Uh, so that's that's I guess is a good thing. The 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 disadvantage of the regulation is, as always, um, there are many many different people involved, um, and um, ESG is also a big topic where everyone has something to say. So you know, if you talk about uh, derivatives, uh, not everyone has an opinion about derivatives because it's very technical. If you talk about ESG, it's quite. Uh, everyone has some sort of an opinion about something. So it gets very, very confusing, which again leads to a very complicated regulation and which is rather, let's say bureaucratic and uh, in, in parts uh, difficult to understand. So that, that I guess is also what, 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 what one of the speakers said here, increases the cost, the administrative person burdens and, and makes slim processes more, um, uh, more fed obviously. So it, it's both. It's good because it raises awareness. It's bad because um, it, it makes things more complicated than they are or they should be. Thanks a lot for, for this uh, very insightful answer. So I, I will move to the second topic for this panel discussion, which is on the measurement. Uh, so the measurement of the E and the S footprints. Um, it, it's a hot topic. It's not only uh, a hot topic in the private market, but also in the publicly listed market because rating agencies, the, their methodologies are quite different and a lot of uh, different standards exist in terms of materiality, such as uh, the global reporting initiatives, a lot of different initiatives with regard to climate reporting. So I would like to ask to our panelists, uh, what are the market standards, uh, whether there are minimum reporting standards to follow and how could we educate uh, the market uh, in terms of reporting? And, and I will first ask this question to, to Melissa. Yes, um, so I, I agree with the, the comments around, around cost and that, that goes to your question around the different um, reporting standards. So there's not one clear reporting standard. So there's already several that have emerged, which um, again, increases the complexity and therefore the cost for a fund manager to understand um, which standard they should be using 
um, what their the expectation of their investors is, as well as educate their portfolio companies. And I think that's a topic not as talked about is, um, you know, a lot of this pressure on reporting complexities falls on the portfolio company themselves, um, who's not as well equipped or educated on what exactly is required. And certainly when you get into um, GHG and emissions data and scope, the different scopes of data, there's real complexity there. So I think when we talk about E and E and S, E is the one that I think in, in what we see at BlackRock and from our clients adds the most complexity. And there's obviously big, big bold statements that have been made um, around a commitment to a net carbon environment. And so it's not just about education, it's also about um, aligned standards and making it e as easy as possible and as transparent as possible. And what I would end with is I, what has transpired in the last couple of years around reporting on ENS isn't all that different than five, 10 years ago when several templates came out around fund and asset reporting and that GPs were really struggling with the multitude of formats and templates that they were being requested for. And I think we're falling down the same road with ESG complexities um, that we need to kind of agree on, on what is a standard um, to minimize the cost and complexity in order to get the returns at the, at the other end. Thanks. Uh, Dorothy, do you have any uh, things to add on this dis discussion with regard to the education of the market, minimum standards? Yeah, no, totally agreed uh, with what just uh, Melissa said. I mean, obviously, it, it would be helpful to have a set of standards that everybody agrees on. And I think that is something that is being developed um, um, also right now. Um, and and we'll, we will see, you know, remains to be seen which standard will then become the gold standard and, and uh, be used by everyone. But at the same time, I think there's no way around um, to, to take into account also the many differences of each, port, each company. Each business is different and has different challenges. And based on the difference also in the materiality, what applies, you know, which are the ESG factors that are material for, for each business, there will be always um, uh, additional reporting or you know, tailored reporting and needs for each company. But I think that also is okay because ultimately all the ESG reporting and the data um, are as um, important as any other financial commercial data of a company if you really take ESG as a value creation tool. And, and therefore walking the extra mile if it comes to reporting, um, I think is fair as long as you know you you achieve something in the end and and not on and only taking you know um, the standards that are not meaningful for the company or using data that is or asking the company for data just because it's part of a standard, but it's not really material for the business. That of course beats then the purpose of, of, of a tailored ESG approach. And then it becomes again, a check the box exercise, which I think we all wouldn't um, agree with. Thanks a lot. Um, Paula, again, is the point of view of the, the, the investor when they are uh, uh, really committing the, the, the money to private equity funds, what they are looking for in terms of reporting? Oh, well, every investor is extremely different. Um, and, um, you know, I think G GPs uh, fall into two categories, you know, those that are very well equipped and have got very large um, departments that can answer these questions and some of the smaller uh, GPs that have got um, a little bit harder role to, to, to complete everything. But um, increasingly, we're finding European investors want a lot more granularity and detail around climate risk, climate reporting um, uh, than ever before, which is fantastic. You know, how are they measuring emissions within their portfolio companies in, in granular detail? Um, the US investors are, are actually looking for more granularity around diversity um, and in particular um, ethnicity um, above, above gender, I would say. But um, th there are definitely two camps falling between what information investors are requiring. But, but no, no, no doubt um, it, it's increasing in terms of what investors want to report on either internally or, or that they're asking their GPs to follow. Thanks a lot. I, I have a question for Joanna and, and Cyril because uh, we know very little about the small end of the market, which uh, certainly is even more difficult to, to get information on. So um, how do we measure ESG footprint of small private firm? Um, any challenge, any recommendation, uh, Joanna? 
So it's a, indeed a, ch a challenge that we have to work through. I think the companies will need help. Um, and they need to have someone in, internally that is in charge. They need to take full ownership of that project being, you know, for example, start reporting on carbon footprint. Um, most of the companies, the way we are seeing it, will need help, uh, external help to be able to measure it accurately. Because ultimately having a number that then means nothing, obviously, is not good enough for us. So I think we have been in the journey of uh, increasing awareness, importance, attributing that to um, a champion that then leads the project internally and then guide them through w what's really the best external support at the minimal cost because obviously, particularly for a small company, there's many other burden topics that they have to address. So this is obviously key and this should be part of the top priorities that they should focus. But I think we have to find a good balance as well to get them on board. Thanks a lot. Cyril? Um, what we observe is that actually there is a sentence uh, in the industry which is uh, good company, good reporting, uh, bad company, no reporting. So just the simple fact that you get, you get some information is already a good sign. Now the, the question is of course what's the right balance between the effort of producing the information and the use of it? Uh, so how much can you act upon it? And then, uh, let's say, the arbitrage with the other duties. Uh, in, a, in a startup, I mean, the entrepreneur works all the time. And so asking for an extra layer of information is extremely challenging to, to, to come up with, and, and especially to make sense of what, what's the reward of the effort, and, and what, do, what do we get out of it? And so um, it, it's not an easy answer. But as I said, you know, just simply starting to, to get some information is actually a progress. Uh, and then, and then we build on that. Thanks a lot. Before I ask to our panelists uh, a last question, I would like to remind you that uh, in, in one, two minutes, we will have uh, time for questions. So please uh, use the chat in order to, to ask your, your question. I will be happy to, to ask them to our panelists. Um, so now I will ask you the same question to all of you. Uh, I would like to summarize this debate on the practicalities of ESG implementation. Uh, if you could give us uh, one key and or concrete recent development regarding ESG in private market, and also one issue that remains to be addressed by the market. So I will start with, with Joanna. So one issue and one key uh, strength? Yeah, one issue, one key recent development. Yes, indeed. So I would say the issue is going to continue to be measurement and the ability to have credible and accurate data. Then on the opportunity, I think there's, there is really uh, encouraging to see the, the, the ESG being high on everyone's agenda, and particularly on climate topics, which I guess it's really concerning for all of us. And, and then if you're deep in the topic, if you start reading what can happen to the world in five years' time, if you continue at this pace, it's really encouraging that our industry is putting this at top of mind. Thanks a lot, Cyril. Um, I think the issue is that we still don't have a definition after probably 40 years, 50 years of debate. We still don't know what is sustainability. It depends on everybody you ask. And so I think that's the biggest challenge. And the opportunity for me is to get efficient carbon markets, actually. If you can put a price on carbon, then you start to make very good progress because then it hurts and then you can get people in line with a certain number of objectives, and, uh, and that, that, would be a, that would be progress. Thanks a lot. Uh, I turn now over to Melissa. Yes, um, so the, the issue I would say, um, and I feel like by the time we get to the end, we're all probably gonna say somewhat of the same thing, but is um, the reporting challenges and, and accurate data that's measurable. Um, and then the opportunity, I, I agree that I think getting to a net carbon environment and the focus on around climate and really having this industry lead the change um, and be a part of that, especially as money moves from older generations to younger generations, I think that's a big opportunity as it's such a focus for the, for the younger generations and the next generation of wealth. Thanks a lot, Dorothy. 
Um, yes, I think the, the, the risk might be that because the ESG is not something that has really matured uh, globally, uh, there might be a risk that the, that you also get a lot of bad apples into the mix, if you see what I mean, and that some investors might fall for it or that there might be, you know, it's always when there is a new market evolving that, that you also, and the standards are not there yet and are not perfect yet. Uh, that there might be also, again, players in the market who will not act very responsible, but claiming to be responsible. And that might, there's always the risk of a certain setback. Uh, but but to, to end on a positive note, what I found amazing and what is really uh, delightful, I think, especially during the corona pandemic now, that ESG made such a huge jump head on and is now top of mind of everybody. Because at the very beginning of the pandemic, I think we all dealing with ESG on a daily basis, we thought, oh, this might now fall in the background, it might not be seen as so relevant right now, but the opposite is true, and I thought that was just great to see. Thanks a lot. Uh, Paula? Um, so as other panelists have said, you know, this is all about the climate and how to achieve results, I think, in, in the fastest way possible. And, and, you know, that is achieved through money moving. And I guess the question really is, you know, one, and it's, this, is, this answers both the opportunity and the risk point in the same question in that, um, you know, at what point LPs might change to just only allocating to, to Article 8 and Article 9 funds. But of course, the risk is that there aren't enough GPs in that category yet. To, to warrant warrant that move and and also is the regulation um, substantial enough that that everyone starts to, starts to to move in the right direction but ultimately um, things will happen when the money continues to move and it it's, it is um, moving at pace in the right direction. Thanks a lot and finally Igor, conclude. Yes, I think um, so. From from my point of view, the. A, a big advancements, ad, advancement of the last, uh, let's say, year or 18 months was that we actually start getting standards. So we get negative impact KPI, so-called PIs. We, we, we have the taxonomy um, and a template is developed for the data exchange between LPs and GPs for the European market. So there are a couple of standards uh, being developed right now, which is, I think is a good thing. The issue is no one has the data right now. <laughs> so it's not the reporting problem, it's not the data problem. And um, the good news is though that the regulator is now developing um, requirements on the company level. So not on the financial uh, uh, participant level, but on the level of the actual company or the portfolio company, requiring them to disclose more and more of this data. So obviously if the portfolio company start disclosing those data, it's possible to report together to validate them and so on. And this will develop definitely in the next quarters. Thanks a lot to, to all our panelists for this very insightful di discussion. Uh, uh, do you have any question in the audience? Because you can use the, the chat or I imagine you can also speak up, but uh, right now I do not have any question in the chat box. So, but probably Ma Emmanuel might have a, oh, I have a question from, uh, from uh, Sarah. Um, Sarah would like to know to get the panelists' perspective on how ESG is acted upon uh, the GP perspective, in the sense that do GP comply ESG wise in their own organization and therefore uh, do what they preach? Um, so, who wants to go for that? I can address that. Um, so, as part of our uh, due diligence on GPs, we try to assess and address exactly that question. I would say it really depends on the level of sophistication of the PE house. So if it's a PE firm that really has taken ESG on their own investment process for quite some time, they are really aware uh, of, of the key topics and how they should scrutinize their, their processes and themselves as they do to the others. Uh, for more for new firms that are um, sta being established now, uh, which is a core focus of what Unigestion does, there I would say they have very high standards, but they are still in the implementation phase because they have just started the entire business, their name in the market, their, their, their sourcing engine, so it's really step by step. So I would say ESG is not the first one that comes, um, as, as I all understood. Uh, but I would say it's generally, I think we see an increasing effort uh, but it's still not totally standardized. 
Thanks a lot. Anyone wants to add something on this? I, I would just briefly add that I think it depends on on the where the uh, how the ESG professional is viewed internally. Um, and so if, if that person is involved in decision making um, or the function itself um, or, or there's remuneration within the firm that's linked to ESG practices um, or a fully involved uh, integrated throughout the processes where trainings embedded throughout, then there's a higher likelihood that the ESG uh, speak matches the actions. Thanks a lot. Uh, any other question from the audience? Then I may, might revert to you, Emmanuel. We are perfectly on time. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So now we will close this uh, first session of HG with the last uh, um, presentation, which is a uh, from uh, Ali Floyd. So Ali is a senior vice president at Campbell Utens. Uh, is a member of the fund placement team with a focus on uh, European business development and sustainable investing. That will be the topic of his talk. Uh, before joining Campbell, uh, he was working for JP Morgan in M&A and he served in the British Army. So Ali's presentation title is LP Approaches to Sustainability and uh, is examined, in fact, the recent evolution uh, of the LP investing, uh, especially impact investing and sustainability investing. So, Ali, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. That's very kind and it's a pleasure to be here this morning to talk to you all. And I understand that we might be able to put some slides on the screen. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you today about for the next 10 or 15 minutes is the evolution that we have seen in sustainable investing and particularly how GPs and LPs have evolved uh, within that market. And what I'd like to start is just to provide some context as it relates to what, what we have been doing in this market, just so it gives um, a flavour of, uh, of what we have seen. And so perhaps if we could go to the first slide uh, of that presentation um, on the screen, please. <clears throat> um, so I don't know if you can uh, now see that. I can't uh, see, it, see it on my screen, but I can tell that's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so look, for Campbell Hutchins, um, uh, and I don't mean to turn this into a pitch for our business, um, we have um, been advising uh, on sustainable investing strategies for a number of years, but crucially, we set up a dedicated team about three years ago with a view to doing three things. So to raise additional capital for dedicated sustainable investing funds, uh, to help all of our clients as it relates to ESG, and also to be a catalyst for more capital to flow in a positive direction. And if we could go to the following slide, it shows that in that capital raising part and advisory element, we've now um, been raising capital for advising on approximately $14 billion of capital in what we would consider or for what we would consider as dedicated sustainable investing strategies. And that's in infrastructure, uh, private equity, and in private credit. And so it gives you a sense of the scale uh, of the opportunity and the scale of the strategies that are now being deployed uh, in this space. And so if we could go to the following slide, what I'd like to start uh, with is really what we've seen in the evolution uh, of what we would call broadly the, the impact investing market. And the first point to note is that the definition of impact has broadened over the last few years. And if you think about or if you'd spoken about impact investing maybe four or five years ago, people would have generally associated that with small scale, early stage, probably frontier market type strategies that are not particularly attractive from an institutional perspective and quite difficult to reconcile with fiduciary duty on the part of an LP. And, and that has broadened over the last few years and the advent for example of the sustainable development goals 
has been very helpful to define what good looks like and enable impact investing to move beyond just that very far or traditional uh, end of the spectrum and into, uh, for example, developed markets and more mature strategies. And what that has meant is that the demand for impact and investment strategies has moved from being the preserve of only a small specialist group of investors, for example, development finance institutions, charities, some faith-based organizations, into a broader, um, <clears throat> into the mainstream. And so absolutely now a focus area for institutional investors. And this has been well publicized and it, there's a lot of commentary in the, uh, uh, within the industry on that. And if we could go to the following slide, please. We'll just reflect for a minute on what that means as it relates to ESG that the panel was just talking about uh, and this uh, idea of a new form of more institutional type or institutionally attractive impact investing. And the handrail that we often use is that when you're talking about ESG, ESG is often about the operations of the businesses that you, uh, that you own. So the how, so how those businesses go about um, uh, their activities as it relates to environmental, social, and governance considerations. Whereas impact is really about the goods and services that those businesses produce and whether or not those goods and services are contributing to a solution to a global challenge. And, and those global challenges are, are well outlined, for example, in the sustainable development goals. And for LPs, as we'll come on to, to talk about, we see ESG predominantly as a due diligence focus area. So it's something that they need to have good ESG integration in order to be able to commit to a manager. Whereas impact is really about a thematic priority. So increasingly, we are seeing LPs look for uh, impact investment strategies that focus on certain thematics. And if we could go on to the next slide, we can explore that a little bit further. So what are these kind of impact strategies that we're seeing from GPs and, and what are they addressing? Now, there's quite a lot of small text on the slide, but, but it's just to give you a sense. These are not what we think the world should be like. These are examples that we have taken from impact strategies that are live in the market now or being deployed in the market and have attracted capital from institutional LPs. And the point I'd like to make here is really, you can see the breadth of those kind of strategies across energy, education, food and agriculture, environmental management, health and wellness, infrastructure, safety and security, technology, financial services, and the subsectors that accompany them, both in terms of the social side, so the people side, and the environmental side, so, so the planet side. And the point about the breadth of these strategies is that there's no reason, given the fact that these are totally appropriate for private capital approaches, why there should be any trade-off from a risk return perspective in order to deliver positive impact in these kind of subsectors. And that's really important when we think about the evolution of the demand from LPs for this newer kind of impact investing approach. And maybe we could go on to the, the following slide to talk a little bit about that. So if we could, if we look at the, the next slide, uh, what we'll be talking about is how LPs therefore are approaching this. So if we think about the, the and now we're talking less about those specialist impact investors and more about the mainstream institutional investor market and how they're approaching uh, impact investing. And there's really two ways that LPs are looking to allocate uh, to this part of the market. The first is to have a separate dedicated bucket for impact investing. So I have my uh, 100 million, 100 billion, whatever it is, program for private capital. And I'm going to take 5% of that and I'm going to put it in a separate vehicle. And from that, I'm going to allocate to impact investing strategies. And we've seen a number of examples of that. 
and we continue to see more LPs taking that approach. However, as, as we'll come on to talk about um, to, to finish off, more and more LPs are saying, we're not going to separate this out from our main portfolio. Actually, we see a number of the themes within sustainability and impact being wholly appropriate for our core private markets portfolio. And so increasingly, we are seeing investors look to allocate to sustainability or dedicate to sustainability or impact investing funds from their core private markets portfolio, which is really important when we think about the scale of the capital that can be deployed into this space. Because by definition, if it's 5% of your allocation, uh, you're going to have less firepower and less capital flowing in this positive direction than it's if it's coming from the core portfolio. So if we, if we go on to the, the next slide, please. And this is the, the, the final slide. Just to think about what are those uh, priorities for LPs then? If those investors are saying, we're not gonna take a, an approach where we just do 5% of our allocation into funds that are calling themselves impact, rather we're gonna allocate from our core portfolio. So how does that approach, uh, what does that approach look like for LPs? Well, firstly, it's quite useful for those LPs to identify, and often we see them identifying priorities within their own sustainability agenda uh, to then uh, go for in their, their private markets allocation. And those priorities are quite consistent when we talk to investors in terms of how they're ranked um, as they look uh, to allocate in this area. And there's a little bit of a nuance between uh, LPs in terms of where they are geographically located. But for European investors, there's a high degree of consistency in that prioritization of the sustainability themes, with the first being climate and the environment being number one, the second being healthcare, and then the third, there's a little bit more, depending on who you ask, of divergence, but often resource efficiency, sometimes financial inclusion, sometimes education. And then for those LPs that have more priorities or a longer list of priorities, then there can be a longer tail of other uh, uh, sustainability priorities within those. But it tends to be uh, those top three for institutional investors at the moment looking at this space. If you go to North America, it is slightly different. And we've seen a really sharp rise in the prominence of the focus on diversity and inclusion uh, in the United States and Canada over the last 18 months. And in some cases that has displaced climate and the environment uh, as the number one priority for institutional investors looking to allocate uh, to, this, to this area. And so a little bit of divergence uh, geographically. What this means if you're an LP looking to allocate to this space is that your opportunity set is wider. And one of the big frustrations that we found for investors who are looking to allocate to impact is the opportunity set of GPs that can both satisfy their fiduciary duty by having demonstrable track record of, of market rate returns or, or leading returns and also deliver impact is very small. There's not that many dedicated GPs, sort of self-labeled impact funds who are doing that, although the number is growing. And so that's a challenge from an allocation perspective. We're finding that LPs who take a thematic approach are less constrained by that a dynamic because they don't have to only look at what we might call self-labeled impact funds, but they can look at sector specialists as well within their thematic areas. So for example, if they're looking to invest in um, to solutions to, to mitigate or adapt to climate change, then there's a much wider array of energy transition focused strategies than there are self-labeled impact funds. Or if they're looking to invest um, to deliver uh, access and lower cost to healthcare, then again, there's a wider array of specialists than there are self-labeled uh, impact funds. And so on again, uh, into resource efficiency, where you might be looking, for example, at food and agriculture specialists. 
So we expect, and I'll just finish off uh, with that observation, that increasingly we'll see capital flowing from LPs' core portfolios into sustainability and impact. And increasingly, along with that capital flowing to sector diversified, self-labeled impact funds, we will also see that capital flowing to sector specialist funds who operate within one of those sustainability uh, thematics that are proving so popular with LPs. And I believe, I think I'm 30 seconds short of my allotted time. Uh, so I will um, leave it there. Of course, if anybody um, has any questions or would like to discuss it any further, we'd be delighted to um, have that conversation uh, at any time after uh, the conference today. Uh, and it's been a real pleasure to speak to you all this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ali. Thank you for this uh, last and super interesting talk. So this ends the first session on uh, ESG investing uh, for private equity. Uh, we have a 10-minute break, so the conference will reconvene at 11.05 uh, uh, for the second session dedicated on uh, AI application in private equity uh, with our second guest uh, academic uh, speaker, Ludovic Falipou, professor uh, from Oxford. So see you at 11.05. Thank you. Hello, it's, uh, so let's uh, reconvene for the second uh, session. So let me introduce our second uh, guest speaker, uh, Ludovic Falipo. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Ludo. Ludo uh, have been uh, supportive for this conference from the start. Uh, Ludo is a financial uh, economics uh, professor at Said Business School. Um, he's the author of a bestseller, Private Equity Led Bear. Uh, I think that so many people know him in both the academia and the industry. His research uh, specialized with a focus on fee tracking, interest alignment, and return benchmarking in the private uh, market space. Uh, Ludovic research paper have been widely cited in academia, but also in the press. Uh, just want to cite uh, some recent paper uh, that he published in Journal Investing in 2020. Title is Inconvenient Fact, Private Equity Returns a Billionaire Factory. And in this article, I've created, a, I will say, a lot of uh, debates uh, among the financial press, but also among the industry. Uh, so Ludo's presentation today uh, is about advanced statistics and research in private markets, and it will examine, in fact, several potential uses of AI in private markets, from NLP to low-tech. So Ludo, the floor is yours for 15 minutes, and after we'll be joined by Gideon Ozik. Ludo. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, in terms of slides, I believe you guys are in control of them, right? Otherwise, I can share. Let me share them. No, Ludo, you, you just have to say next uh, slides, and, and this is okay. We will, uh, we will right. run them for you. All right. So I, I just have 15 minutes to, to tell you a bit about what I see are, are the tools that we are using and maybe using more in private markets when it comes to uh, advanced statistics. So uh, next slide. Um, so if we, if we think about um, what characterizes private markets compared to public markets when it comes to research and statistics, um, we have a large amount of information in private markets it, but it's not really big data. Big data is usually trillions of data points. We, we usually are not in that space. So we have some big data, but we don't have really big data. Um, something that is very characteristic is that the data is unstructured. And that comes from the fact that almost all of the documents on all the things we see are tailored or, or are case specific. It is even the case that two funds may report an IR, something as simple as an IR, and they have calculated it following different methods. And therefore, these two numbers are not even really comparables. Um, but the main documents that we are facing in, 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 in private markets of most interest to investors, things like PPMs, uh, so uh, fundraising prospectuses, uh, or limited partnership agreements, so you have a contract between the LPs and the GPs, these documents are highly tailored. They are not standardized. 
And that's very characteristic of private markets. So that means that you are dealing with documents that you cannot compare, um, that, you that, that are very hard then from a statistical viewpoint to analyze because they are very, very tailored. So the cartoon here on the right hand side uh, is, 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 is characteristics of that, say, you know, here is an LP executive summary and that goes for thousands of pages. And then you would have to speak about all the side letters, uh, MFN provisions, et cetera, that would also run for pages and pages and they won't be the same from one fund to the other. Um, so that from a statistical viewpoint is, is, is extremely challenging. Um, the data are low frequency. So we are typically working with quarterly data uh, at best in private markets. Uh, in public markets, we are in the less than a millisecond. So we are very low frequency data and most of the information in, in private markets is qualitative and not quantitative. So we do have information on, on, on prices, on accounting, but it's, it's relatively small. Most of the information we have are things like contracts that are like thousands of pages in total. If you add the side letters to an LPA, it is like fundraising prospectuses, which to which if you add like all the other due diligence information, such as the interviews, background checks, etc., would also run in the thousands of pages. So it is a lot of information and the vast majority is qualitative. So that's a, a, a a key characteristic of private markets, and that means that some tools would be better fitted for this research in that space compared to public equity and, and some tools less so. So the tools that are very natural in, in, a, in a world where you have low frequency qualitative data is going to be natural language processing tools. Um, so they are very natural then to, to bring in, in private markets, and I expect these tools to get used a lot more in private markets. We, we haven't seen too many papers using these tools yet. Interestingly, when we look at financial economics as a field, the finance side of, of the field hasn't used much NLP tools. Um, there is one subsector that has used NLP tools a lot and it's accounting. So if you look at top publications in accounting journals these days or working papers, there is tons of NLP tools being uh, used and that's because accountants as well are facing things like disclosures, um, all kinds of documents where there is a lot of qualitative information. Um, and, and, and they have used these tools a lot. The rest of the finance field hasn't really used them. I expect that as people are doing more research on private markets, as private markets are growing, we should see more NLP uh, um, tools. Again, I, I write maybe big data because our data is not really big. We have like things with like millions of words or maybe it's billions of words, but we're not talking about trillions of, of data points. What is less, uh, sorry, I, one last point and then I, I, I come to that. Um, what will be less useful, so this was a plus and a minus, what may be less useful in private market research will be tools that are really what people think about when they talk about artificial intelligence that are, I will detail that, but that is what is called unstructured machine learning or artificial intelligence, things that are at the end of the day, data mining. We, we won't be really able to use this in, in, in private markets because you need an environment with a lot of repeated observations that are very similar. If you're going to have a computer learning by himself in an unstructured way, you need a lot of very similar re 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 uh, situations repeating a lot. And this is exactly what you, we don't have in private markets. So you, 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 certain tools then are, 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 will be much of less use in, in private markets. So the next slide to, on, on NLP. Um, so to give uh, 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 a few examples of what you can uh, uh, do with, with, with NLP um, is that you can, so this and the first one, each bread point is, is, is a paper I'm, um, I'm working on, I'm afraid. So the, the first one is, and is an example of a paper where we have tried to detect the degree of private market exposure of publicly traded companies by analyzing their regulatory filings, press release, and so on, in order to have like a mimicking portfolio of private markets, something that correlates with private market returns as much as possible using public market uh, uh, instruments such as equity debt that is publicly traded. And once you have a close publicly traded substitute of private markets, you can then create like a hedging portfolio, for example. So if you have 
if you're over invested in private markets, you could have a hedge uh, by shorting the public market equivalent of this private market portfolio. You can think of it as a substitute as well. If you're under invested in private markets, if you're late compared to your target allocation, you could uh, uh, top up using public market closed substitutes and, and, and you can also use them in complements. So this paper that, that um, I cannot tell you too much about, but you can email me if you're interested. The idea is that because you, you, you can use all these words out there that companies use to describe what they are doing to, to, to see, to tailor a private market equivalent portfolio. And there is actually a lot of companies that are publicly listed whose returns and cash flows are highly dependent on how well the private markets are doing. Um, and that you can detect by, by using a combination of big data uh, uh, approach with, with uh, natural language processing tools. A second paper that is closer to, to uh, be released and more academic, sorry, I'm still on the first slide, um, is, is the one with uh, uh, Rainer Brown, um, Borja Fernandez Tamayo, Flores Lopez de Sila, uh, Florencio Lopez de Silanes, and Nat Natalia Sigrist, which is that we give fundraising prospectuses, uh, we take fundraising prospectuses, some sections that are qualitative about what is the investment strategy of a fund um, and, and potential value add plan, et cetera. What is it they do when they invest? And we try to use, again, natural language processing tools first to quantify this qualitative information. And once you have some quantity, quantitative information, then you can use some machine learning tools, which I'll talk about in a sec. So you, this is a, a more classic example where you have all this qualitative information about the fund manager telling you what did they do, uh, and, and, and you try to convert it into quantitative information using first an NLP tool. And then from there, when you want to do your forecast about can I forecast which fund is going to have high returns or not, you're going to use statistics tools. And then you have a choice between traditional and modern machine learning. And I, I'll talk a bit about that difference. And the last point, examples of other studies that would use natural language processing tools that uh, um, is, is, is where this is a paper with, with Marie, Marie Lambert, who's, who, who was just here a few minutes ago, for example, where you can look at an employee, employee reviews and you can have millions of reviews that you can then analyze with an NLP tool, again, to convert them into a quantitative uh, 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 information, which you can then bring to, in that paper, is standard uh, uh, statistical tools to uh, uh, analyze what employees are saying about how they feel when they work under private equity ownership, for example. But you can use social media, you can use all kinds of things. In fact, the paper, I've, uh, uh, well, so that, that's where and, and how I think NLP tools can be used. And the next slide, um, so, so thank you. Um, so so to, a lot of this qualitative information is given to investors, so you could get the information from the investors. But it's, it's difficult to find investors who want to collaborate and share qualitative information. A, a big tool is uh, the internet that has a lot of qualitative information. And so there's a lot of websites one can scrape to find uh, 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 useful information to do uh, uh, this kind of analysis. So you still need an NLP tool to, once you have scraped the internet because this information is going to be qualitative. An example of, of, of things you can scrape for, for, from the internet or from some very big databases. So there's a paper which is nascent that, that I'm working on. I'm so happy to, 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 to talk to anyone offline on, on, on this more. Is that, for example, there's a website called Burning Glass Technologies, which has like millions of job ads. And this, this paper we, we have started would be saying, you have more and more people working under private equity ownership. We are at 9 million in the US, probably by now it's, it's 10 million. This number is from last year. Um, so, so you have a very large number of people working under private equity ownership. There are more and more people working under private equity ownership. Um, and if private equity firms have a different taste uh, for like job type, for example, in particular, if they are uh, accelerating the adoption of AI in companies, you should be able to reflect to see that in the kind of jobs they advertise once they take over a company. And so that's the sorts of things you, you, you can do. You take these millions of job ads, you look at which of these companies has uh, switched to private equity ownership and when, and you look at whether the job ads differ before and after uh, uh, an acquisition. Again, you're going to use an NLP tool and you're going to have 
have a, a good tool for, for scraping all this information from that website. Um, so the paper I had just mentioned earlier, we use Glassdoor website, we, sc we scrape it to, to, to get em employee satisfaction information uh, for the reviews with an NLP tool, with scores, with uh, standard tools, and then we use a standard uh, um, statistical uh, approach to, to analyze that. Um, so you have all kinds of papers about like also like using LinkedIn to see the importance of networks, where again, you could look if in the practical context, the networks are more important than the non practical context. All of these would involve uh, uh, scraping the internet. In fact, a paper I just reviewed that, that is not uh, even released, uh, looked at uh, mobile phone data for people entering uh, stores and see whether there is less people visiting a given store after it has been announced you would get in the practical ownership and look at whether there is a relationship between that and the reputation of a practical uh, firm. And this is again like, like relatively big data, it's not massive, but uh, and, and gives a, an idea about the kind of, of, of things that people in private market research have to do compared to what people were doing in public market research. Uh, other example of, you know, does it matter when you are in practical ownership or does it change? Uh, there was a paper where we scraped trip advisors to see satisfaction of people with hotels and see again whether it made a difference before and after a practical transaction. And there's also a paper by um, uh, uh, Christopher Spangius looking also at, at, at the effect on, on, on hotel uh, quality using some trip advisor and other data uh, um, when, when the hotel goes under practical ownership. Um, so ne next, next, next slide. So I was mentioning earlier, like the different tools that one can use. And there are two, two types of, of machine learning tools. Again, I think artificial intelligence is, is, is certainly not for private equity, um, private markets. So you have supervised machine learning tools like lasso regressions, random forest, et cetera. And, and I'm comfortable, we, are, we see applications of that in, in private markets. I think we'll see more. We can use some supervised machine learning tools. Unsupervised machine learning tools are extremely challenging. This is the, the data mining uh, type of tools. There is no way if information is not standardized, not at high frequency, et cetera, that you can bring any sorts of tools. So the only one you can maybe use among the unsupervised machine learning tools is clustering. And I have a paper with Elise Goury and Will Gottsman where we, 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 we do these sorts of, we do clustering with private market data but you are facing situations where the data is highly unstructured, meaning like you have some quarters without a data point, you have some funds that have four years of history, some have 16, some have 20. Uh, you have short time series anyway, because even if a fund has 15 years of history, it's 15 years of quarterly data, uh, and that's not long time series at all. So it, it, it's pretty challenging. So the application, the paper with Elise and Will is, is, is looking at whether we can form portfolio on the basis of a return dynamics, uh, uh, and clustering uh, uh, funds this way, rather than looking at their self descriptions, for example. So in terms of like the big question here is, is when you use a supervised machine learning tool, such as random forest and the like, is it really making a big difference compared to the standard statistical tool that we are used to? Um, so in when I, I grew up and was raised as an econometrician, and it's a bit, uh, uh, I was raised to, even if you do forecasting to use things like AIC criteria, et cetera. And I think a big question would be, uh, are these random forest algorithm and the like, things that have been more designed for forecasting, are they doing better than the, stand, the standard economic tricks tools? Uh, it seems to be the case. Uh, and so that's why I think like the exercise I was mentioning earlier with the paper with Natalia and others, that when we are looking at trying to forecast a practical fund performance based on the qualitative information in their PPM, um, things like random forest algorithms and the like could be well suited for uh, uh, this type of exercise. And that's, that's quite new. We, we, most financial economists think more like econometricians, uh, standard ones. And the last slide uh, on, I wanted to say something on low tech. Um, I've tried to do quite a lot of on, on, on that space. There's a lot going on in Oxford in that space. It's, my conclusion is that it's nearly hopeless. Um, the idea is that you, you, we, we have tried many things such as 
you take a limited partnership agreement, you're asking a lawyer to for their annotations, right? So they, when a lawyer reviews a legal document, they write annotations and say, this clause is not quite standard or this, this word is a bit unusual, uh, this should be changed, et cetera. And we're trying to make like uh, uh, an algorithm learn from what kind of annotations happen when, and even with hundreds or 500 annotation set of annotations, you wouldn't manage to get there. And that's quite normal because these are still small samples. And if you think about a legal a law firm and legal contracts, maybe this firm has reviewed 1000 contracts at best. And if they have annotated them all in a systematic way it would already be a miracle. And thinking that you're gonna feed a machine a thousand uh, uh, sets of annotations and hoping that this would be a strong learning. And from then on a machine can automatically annotate a contract is extremely uh, naive, it doesn't work. We've tried in many, many ways and with many different tools, uh, it, 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 it doesn't work. And so as long as things are not mega standardized, like it is in public markets, when the SEC says, this is a 13F for form, this is how to file it. Uh, and and once, you are not, once you depart from this level of, of structure of, of data, um, anything such as like what we tried in low tech is, 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 is out of reach. So that's what I wanted to, to say, thank you. Thank you so much, Udo. Thanks for this uh, stimulating uh, presentation. So in order to complement uh, Ludo's uh, presentation, um, now um, we got uh, Gideon Ozik that will join us. Uh, so Gideon, in fact, will, uh, I think, make a, a focus on one part of uh, Ludo presentation, which is uh, the so-called uh, smart data and uh, anything which is coming, in fact, from uh, media and, 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 and from internet. So just a, a short uh, intro. So, so Gideon, in fact, is a managing partner founder of Market uh, Media Statistics, which is a fintech company which is specialized in, in this kind of uh, uh, smart data use. And um, he got a previous experience in uh, Hedge Fund Universe and is also uh, a PhD uh, from uh, EDEC Business School and is also an affiliate professor there. So Gideon, I think it's pretty early for you. So thanks for accepting the invitation. Uh, the floor is yours. And after, perhaps, uh, if Ludo want to react on the Gideon presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Emmanuel, and thanks, uh, Emmanuel and, uh, and Serge, for uh, extending this uh, really generous invitation to, to contribute to the conference. Uh, so when you guys asked me to uh, join the, the conference, I, was, uh, I thought it was a really great opportunity to take a hard look at uh, what we've done over the past uh, really uh, decade or so when it comes to big data or alternative data and, and, uh, and the use uh, uh, of this uh, type of information in, uh, in asset pricing, really. Uh, most of our work uh, has been uh, naturally done on, uh, on public markets, but it's actually very interesting that in the past, I would say, two year and a half to two years, uh, we've been getting a lot of requests actually coming from uh, private market investors uh, trying to understand better uh, the, the information uh, uh, <clears throat> that is otherwise really opaque uh, about uh, uh, private companies. Uh, next slide, please. So the, <clears throat> let, let, let's just set uh, the stage for a second. So we, if we think about the, uh, the framework where uh, the why uh, <clears throat> side is the, really the asset prices and the X side uh, of the equation is the features related uh, to individual companies. Uh, what we see in the private market that the Y variable is, is actually very hard to observe. I mean, we don't have uh, good information at the individual firm level uh, that of course there are transactions, but they're not necessarily available to uh, other market participants not involved in them. And, uh, and so it's hard to, to observe the Y variable. And that's of course has a lot of implication on, on the private market uh, analysis because if you don't see the prices, it's impossible to predict it. It's impossible to, uh, or at least uh, it's hard to, to measure risk. Uh, and, and of course, to measure uh, uh, and estimate covariances and therefore do portfolio optimization. Uh, so it's hard on the Y side. On the X side, of course, there is uh, in, uh, inferiority in terms of uh, private market 
relative to uh, public markets, where in the public markets, of course, there's analyst coverage uh, that is more often, uh, there's uh, a financial, uh, uh, financial reporting uh, and disclosures and, and, and you know, things like uh, uh, transcripts, for example, of managers would be very, very hard to get uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to the private markets. So we start with a challenge. Next slide, please. Uh, but when it comes to the x-axis, there's there's actually some hope uh, because there there are there is information available uh, that, uh, that 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 we can actually use. Um, uh, here on this table, I focus. This is a, a, a not an uh, an, a, an exhaustive list of things that uh, people use, but this is actually a list of things that we have used either in academic uh, research or in the in the practice. Uh, uh, so, so I'm more comfortable to talk about uh, these, these items. Media coverage, for example, uh, is something that I'll, I'll talk uh, a lot about. Uh, food traffic uh, uh, um, <clears throat> is something that was mentioned in the previous session. You know, how do you measure the, 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 the sales uh, proxies for different companies? So we have a paper about that, in the, of course, in the public market. Uh, web traffic, uh, brand interaction, consumer interaction with brands. Uh, website scraping, including encyclopedic uh, uh, sources, uh, social social network, of course, have a lot of information as well. And one thing that I want uh, I would like to mention at the end of this uh, 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 this presentation is actually a SEC filing that is true that private companies uh, do not uh, uh, report their uh, financials uh, <clears throat> uh, such as 10K to the to the regulator, but we can actually learn a lot about. Uh, uh, private companies from the disclosure that public companies are making. So I'll give you an example there. Next slide, please. So uh, a few examples from the media. So uh, it's true that there's a, an information gap uh, in, in the private markets. It's hard to know uh, the inside of a private company, but we can use proxies such as media coverage to try to understand what is going on, what, what is kind of the fundamentals of, uh, of private companies. In this example, uh, we use our tools to analyze the revenue growth as it projected by media coverage of a private firm, in this case, Airbnb. So what we've seen, for example, here that if you use AI or whatever you wanna call it, uh, analytics on uh, large sets of uh, media items, you, you, in this case, you could, you could actually detect that Airbnb uh, revenue growth has turned negative uh, from the perspective of the media uh, starting a year before the pandemic. As an insight that it's important to private uh, market investors. Next slide, please. And other measures out of uh, uh, dozens of different measures that we developed uh, is job growth. Uh, <clears throat> we wanted to see like uh, from the perspective of the media, uh, how, how does it cover in, in individual private firm when it comes to hiring or firing, uh, management turnover and so on uh, in, uh, from the media's perspective. And here we see uh, uh, the example of SpaceX that announced uh, uh, <clears throat> or was rumored to announce 10% uh, uh, layoff of their workforce somewhere in the beginning of uh, 2019, 2019. And we see the media kind of started talking about it uh, a bit before it happened. We also see here Airbnb example where uh, the pandemic obviously uh, affected uh, the, the, the job uh, growth to the negative side, of course, uh, in, in, in the workforce. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the, the opportunity here, of course, is to think about uh, now we saw two examples, kind of a time series uh, of, of different measures, but here we can see we can actually bring uh, together a panel of private companies, as, as you can see here from uh, earlier this week. Uh, we look uh, uh, at the different measures such as job growth or, or others, and then we can uh, have a cross-sectional uh, analysis, a comparison between uh, different, different private companies, which start to resemble uh, the information we have uh, about public companies. Next slide, please. Um, the, uh, this is a recent paper uh, that, that, we, that we actually did on, of course, uh, pu public markets, where we look at uh, SEC uh, um, reporting of, of all public companies, and we try to figure out what 
uh, companies think about their competitors. And uh, of course, this was applied to the public market, but the idea I think could be extended to the private markets where uh, public companies report who they think their ma main competitors are, and that could be both private or public uh, companies. So we can learn a lot about that from the network analysis. And I think that was mentioned in the previous, uh, previous presentation as well. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so to, to uh, well, so we, we haven't, uh, uh, we, so far we covered the X, uh, the X variable and not the Y variable. And again, uh, the Y variable is, uh, I think is the most challenging here because price are not observed. But the question that I, that, that I have is whether we could use or we can build uh, a tool like Zillow that uh, of course estimate the prices of other private uh, uh, assets, real estate, uh, private real estate uh, ownership on uh, properties and use uh, machine learning to estimate uh, <clears throat> prices of private companies as well. So to summarize, uh, I think uh, the, the, there are many challenges when it comes to applying AI and big data tools on private markets. Uh, I think in the X, on the X side of the equation, uh, there are a lot of opportunities uh, to learn and to bridge the, the information gap uh, when, it, when it comes to private companies. On the Y side of the equation, it's more challenging, uh, but there might be a little bit of hope as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gideon. Uh, Ludovic, do you want to, to react on uh, Gideon's presentation and especially on possibility to develop a, a Zillow, uh, so like an uh, estimated tool for private companies? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know uh, about Zillow too well, so I won't comment too much on that. I, I, I think that, I mean, a lot of what has been described here, we, we, we do see it in, 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 in research coming up. Like I, like I said, there is a paper that was looking at like the number of people entering stores, you know, right after an announcement of an acquisition, things like that. Um, I wouldn't call that AI, I would call it data analytics, but then maybe it's because I'm, I'm, I'm an academic and I, uh, <laughs> I um, uh, overemphasize words. So, so I guess, you know, people don't find data analytics too, too sexy and you call it something AI and then it becomes like a, 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 an excitement. So, so fine, yeah, no, I think data analytics are important. Um, uh, and, and I agree that you can, you can infer a lot from a lot this qualitative information. Like the example, I, the two examples that I, that I had mentioned in the presentation, one is the, the one where we replicate private equity returns with public equity securities. Um, we, we do, we use public press release for that mainly. So it, it is like what the press is saying is telling you a lot about what companies are doing. Um, also a remark is that in, in outside of the US, like in Europe, we do have the accounting of private firms and public firms. So we have the accounting, it's just, it's a massive mess to analyze, but we, we, we do have accounting information. And the third thing that, that re reminded me also uh, uh, um, in, in this presentation is some data like Glassdoor in, a, in another paper, uh, uh, not ours, was shown that if you look at employee reviews in real time, you can forecast the accounting information that will be released in one or two years time. So like Gideon said, if you, if you don't even have the accounting information, maybe it's not that big a deal because what matters most was to have it as early as possible. And that would have been via social media or uh, sites like Glassdoor anyway. Uh, and so you can learn a lot about how well companies are doing um, by looking at, uh, at social media or Glassdoor and these sorts of things. Thank you. Um, so, do, so basically, do you think that uh, machines uh, can learn uh, private finance? I'm, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about the why, right? Because uh, this is, as both of you mentioned, this is where you get the challenges. So you get low frequency with respect to the prices. So in terms of predictability, might be some challenges. And second question I have for you is uh, with respect to the private equity industry. So uh, won't there be any resistance? Because to my understanding, this is a pretty uh, uh, human, uh, human industry where relationships are very important. So if machines start, in fact, to, to be more, uh, more important in this business, so there will be a big disruption in terms of the organization of this private equity. So we'd like to perhaps uh, first point on, on, on the predictability. So what is the 
the, 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 the limits and uh, the frontier, and the second with respect to um, the PE uh, uh, industry, the structure of human versus machines. Yeah, so, so I, th I think I'll address the first point. I mean, uh, I, I think I think like <clears throat> there's, uh, I think there, there's hope. I mean, uh, in, in our, uh, and again, big data is a, is a bit a, is a bit of a tricky term and uh, and coined uh, uh, and it's very cool. But but in terms of data analytics and understanding uh, really proxies for what's going on inside companies, uh, we're you know ahead of time of of actually reporting. So we 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 saw we show in our uh, in our J JFE paper that uh, management uh, probably uh, of public companies right. Uh, know ahead of time that uh, you know the sales are going to are, are, are you know are, are going to be reported uh, uh, more negative than the market expects, let's say, and 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 the, and, uh, and and we see their their changes in the behavior pre pre reporting it uh, in terms of disclosure, in terms of guidance, and so on. Uh, so I think if if that's uh, so important in the public market where the Y variable is observed and people react faster. It, 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 it's it, it's uh, many times more important in the private market where the disclosure requirements are 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 so uh, uh, le less uh, severe. So so I so I definitely see uh, uh, um, you know an opportunity or a necessity of using uh, proxies uh, for you know what for uh, for uh, the fundamentals for what's going on inside the company when it comes to sales, when it comes to, uh, to other uh, measures of, um, of fundamental uh, that, uh, that, that would be extremely useful in, in the private market. So that's on the first part. On the second part, I don't know if I'm that qualified to answer, uh, but, but you know, we see it in many different industries where there is resistance and, uh, and you know, that, uh, that has to, uh, to be played out. Sometimes it takes uh, a generation and sometimes it uh, it happens much faster than uh, you know transition from uh, manual to to automated uh, processes. Thank you, Gideon. Ludo. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's machine versus versus humans. It's, it's standardization, the key word. So the, the, if if you keep things non-standardized, it's it you will have a lot of humans that needs to intervene because every contract is tailor made, etc. So only a human can write that. But, but it is weird that there is not more standardization. And so once I think it's ineluctable and we, have, we are starting to see some standardization, once you have standardization, then you, have, you need less humans. Uh, and, and, but, but for machines to step in, they, you need something very simple and repeated, et cetera, and, and that you're very far from it anyway. Um, like, the, 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 the startup that was looking the most promising that also came out of, of, of a business school here is someone was doing like non-disclosure agreements in low tech. And even non-disclosure agreements that are like really standard legal documents, they run into all kinds of trouble trying to automatize them. Um, so I don't think it would be so much like the machine versus the humans. It's more like standardization is bound to happen to save costs because the costs are huge right now in print markets and 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 that standardization will reduce human human labor that is required thank you very much so now i'm passing uh, to the next presentation thank you again ludo thank you gideon um, now we have uh, the presentation from uh, marja georgievic so marija is the head of research at ifront uh, part of blackrock She's in charge of a thought leadership program focused on alternative investment industry market research. Uh, she's also responsible for the company's media outreach activities related to sharing research insight with general public. And prior joining Efront, she worked as assistant lecturer uh, at the economics department from Belgrade University. She holds the MEC from INSEAD and MEC in quantitative finance. So, my presentation is not directly related to AI, uh, but she will uh, be a member of the uh, panel after, and so she will uh, share our views with respect to AI in the industry. Uh, it's more a macro uh, general perspective about what is going on with respect to the PE funds, uh, notably with respect to the aging of uh, the industry, and with respect to the holding periods uh, with respect to the portfolio companies. So thank you, Maja.
Thank you. Good day to you. It's been two years, too long. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Serge, for having us here. Um, it's always a pleasure for us to support this unique event that um, brings together some of the most prolific researchers together with, uh, with industry professionals. I'm not going to take too much of your time, just want to share uh, with this group what's new at EFRONT, BlackRock, uh, with, uh, with our research efforts, and uh, just share with you a few snippets of, uh, of the industry trends. So next slide, please. Uh, what I want to tell you is that um, essentially there are four um, main, um, yeah, so the, the next slide, thank you. So there are four uh, main pillars that are supporting uh, our thought leadership activities. Uh, the first one being that we are maintaining uh, the 20 year long history of transaction data. So the capital calls and distributions that are exchanged between uh, the institutional investors and their GP managers. Uh, for more than 4,500 alternative market funds. This is allowing us to uh, share as accurate as it gets the performance figures, and that would be net of fees. We can also analyze the evolution of calls and distributions and address uh, all the economic questions that are associated with it. The, the second pillar is actually um, news I want to share with you. Uh, before we're actually announcing it in two weeks from now, uh, we have unlocked the data set of 39,000 private equity deals uh, sourced directly from GPs and their quarterly reports. This data set includes uh, information on deal characteristics, activities, so the investments, exits, and also financial stats. So it is essentially the data from the investment schedule, which is provided in the quarterly report. And uh, this is now unlocking an entirely new universe uh, for us and, uh, and the research we can do, the questions we can address with this data is uh, uncomparable uh, with what we're doing right now. The third pillar is simply a privileged position uh, that, we are, that we are a service provider on both ends for asset managers and asset owners. And as such, we can describe uh, the operational practices in the industry. And finally, when we need to hand collect uh, the data, we resort to surveys. And uh, normally we have to do it with institutional investor community to be able to understand their approach and, and their demand in the first place. So the next slide. Uh, I'm going to show you some of our latest findings. This is a small collection of insights to motivate uh, the further conversation. Uh, so uh, I will show you the actual charts and the figures, but the private equity funds are aging. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the better a fund, the more likely it has some significant assets left in the portfolio. Uh, the assets themselves are held over a longer period of time. This is something we documented well. Uh, exits in 2020 associated with, uh, are associated with holding periods longer than the historical average. And finally, performance and the selection risk are increasing with the holding period. All these observations are actually giving rise to, uh, so the, the secondary market is expanding and we are expecting to see more of it. Then the advent of long-term funds, so the funds with a mandate of 15 years and more, then GP-led restructuring activities and, uh, and continuation funds, the advent of continuation funds. Uh, now we have to be cognizant of these trends and, and uh, on our side, we are going to make sure to track the fundamentals of this industry so that we can uh, inform, inform the, the community and, uh, and the industry players about uh, where, where the industry is going. So are we seeing more aging funds? We do see more aging funds. And uh, the way we were able to, I, the next slide, sorry. So the, the way uh, we were able to um, identify it was uh, that uh, we see that funds that originate from years 2004, five, six, they, they, they're still active. And actually, when you put together the vintage years 2004 until 2008, the unrealized value stands at 
4.2%. And uh, these are all the funds that grew older than the usual private equity fund that are typically set with a lifespan of 10 years and potential extension of two years. So uh, what are the repercussions? What are the implications for, for the secondary market? So uh, if we apply this figure to the size of, of this market, so the potential secondary investment uh, asset under management in the ground is uh, around $180 billion uh, under the assumption that the assets can be sold at their reported net asset value. Now, uh, the secondaries are active even with the, the younger uh, uh, vintage years. So if you take everything combined, I mean, the potential for the secondary market is close to two, $3 trillion. But uh, this is uh, something that we can immediately identify. Um, the next slide. Now, if we want to check what are these assets, we discover that these are actually the assets of the top performing funds. Um, and this is something which is more pronounced uh, with the VC subsample of, of the private equity pool of funds. Uh, and the one thing uh, that you should be aware of is that, um, and why is that the case in particular? Because evaluating the remaining assets requires industry expertise, just as young companies that have required a longer time to mature. Uh, and also a deep understanding of market dynamics and, and, uh, and the exit environment. So the, the remaining, the residual uh, assets in, in these aging funds are actually uh, assets uh, belonging to a top performing funds. We see that uh, for top 5% performing funds, the residual value from the vintage years 2007 and 8 is close to 40%. So that's pretty massive. The next slide. Now we can move down to a more granular view, and this is where we actually invoke uh, this D-level data set, uh, and we can confirm that the holding periods are longer over time. Um, we uh, smoothed this series and looked at three-year averages to avoid any uh, specific exit environments in, in, in each of the exit years. And this is all performed on a set of 15,000 realized deals. And uh, th this historical analysis of the holding period shows that over the past decade, we have that the three-year average um, went from 3.8 years in 2010 to something close to 5.5 years in, in 2019. And what we do, we do actually include 2020 here in the calculation of, of a three-year average for 2019. So the, the assets themselves are held over a longer period of time. Uh, a bit more detail, so the next slide. Uh, if we zoom in to 2020 and compare it with the historical average, what we find is that um, the deals exited in 2020, uh, and if we contrast them with the previous history, we find some surprising results. First of all, overall, it took more time to realize the deals in 2020 compared to the historical average, uh, but it took less time for deals operating in materials and consumer staples industries. There, we actually see that the holding periods for the deals operating in materials and consumer staples uh, that were sold in 2020, they were held over a shorter period of time than, than what was the case previously. But where we see that the, this difference and where the holding periods were longer than the average and, uh, and this discrepancy was the largest is actually the healthcare and IT industry. And then much less for financials. Something to think about, why is that a case? And finally, the, the next slide. Thank you. Um, so, the performance and selection risk are increasing with the holding period. Um, you can see on this chart, so we, we uh, plot the, the money on invested capital for each of the realized deals, its cross of fees, and the spread in MOIC against the holding period. And uh, what you can see is that so the MOICs are given in green. Uh, so. Um, they're increasing with the holding period of 
up to five years, and then it stagnates at the level of 2.5. Uh, on the other hand, selection risk is increasing. So it's increasing with the holding period going from 4.3 um, times to for a two-year holding period to up to 8.2 for holding an asset for, for 11 years. So it's, it's a bit like uh, um, the longer you hold, it's expected that you would see a divergence in, in performance uh, across the distribution of deals. So this is everything that I wanted to share with you. I think uh, we should be on time now and, uh, that, we can, and that we can move on to, to our panel that I'm so much looking forward to. So I'm passing effectively over to Sarah Thomas from Noama Business School. So just uh, before uh, Sarah uh, introduce the panel, a uh, few words of Sarah. Uh, so Sarah is assistant professor at Neoma. Uh, she got her PhD from Paris Dauphine. And uh, before uh, her actual academic career, she got uh, a corporate life where she was, in fact, uh, uh, in uh, uh, charge of uh, private funds working on m and and also on uh, corporate financing. So, Sarah, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, everyone, uh, for having me. Welcome to all. Welcome to our listeners and panelists, and thank you for joining us today. So, this is an interesting topic. I mean, with the advent of AI, different fields in finance have obviously experienced a revolution in some of their core practices and private markets are no exception. I mean, listening to the session's presentation by Professor Falipu and the follow-on discussion has given us some very interesting insights in that respect. So to continue the discussion basically on the use of AI in private markets and the many implication it holds probably for the future, we are joined today by uh, a distinguished panel, I would like to say. So we have with us today, Professor Dr. Cyril Demaria, who was in the previous panel, just to say a few more words, so he was already introduced and we cherish our panelists, so they got introduced more than once. So Cyril is a renowned international private market expert. He is an affiliate professor at EDIC Business School and collaborates as an expert, like Marie said, with the uh, European Commission and also multiple private equity fund associations. He has held uh, many executive roles and he is notably the author of best-selling books. We are also joined by uh, Maria Djordjevic, whom we had a moment ago with the presentation. So Maria is the vice president at eFront in charge of thought leadership program focused on alternative investment industry market research. She is also responsible for the company's media outreach activities related to sharing research insights with the general public. We have also the pleasure to welcome Dr. Martin Goodson Martin is the chief uh, scientist and CEO of Evolution AI and a specialist in natural language processing and deep learning. He is the chair of the Royal Statistical um, Society data science section, the membership body for data science in the UK, and runs also the largest machine learning community in Europe, London Machine Learning. Also with us today, Dr. Gideon Ozik, whom we had in the discussion a few moments ago. So Gideon is the founder and managing partner of MKT, Media Stats, a technology and data analytics company, which combines expertise in data science and financial economics. His prior academic experience includes teaching at HEC Paris, Université Paris Dauphine, and EDEC Business School, where he is currently an affiliate professor and research associate. And finally, please join me in welcoming Natalia Sigrist. So Natalia is a partner, private equity at Unigestion, where she leads the digitalization of the business with projects across investment activities she is a member of the advisory board of several private equity funds and her professional experience also includes quantitative research, modeling for forex trading, starting and running a business with the education sector and strategy and consulting for startup firms and nonprofit organizations. Thank you all so much for joining us today to all the panelists, welcome again. And um, without any further ado, let's just start our you know, um, agenda for today by providing an overview to our listeners that I think uh, you know, discussing with you was going to be very interesting to share and about the main fields of AI development in the context of private markets. So I would like to kick off the discussion by asking our panelists what components of AI are relevant particularly to private markets. Maybe Martin, you can uh, kick us off with a, an overview or taxonomy of that. 
Thank you, Sara. Um, okay, so I, I think it's fair to say the most exciting applications of AI in the last five years have come from three main areas. Computer vision, natural language processing, which is the use of machine learning algorithms to understand human language, and reinforcement learning. So these fields have really been revolutionized by deep learning neural networks that we've all heard about. So I think just to set the context here, I think computer vision has been production ready for at least six to eight years. Um, natural language processing is becoming production ready. There have been quite a few breakthroughs in the last two or three years. And we're now starting to see natural language catch up to where computer vision used to be. And then finally, reinforcement learning. In my opinion, reinforcement learning is not yet production ready. It works really well for games. It works really well for things like the game of Go, chess, or for computer games. But that's because we can run games in simulation. So we can run millions of games and use this as training data to train our algorithms. But it's really a kind of trick. Um, it's not really suitable for real world scenarios because we can't run realistic simulations for most of the real world scenarios that we care about. But I think something worth noting is that I haven't really mentioned tabular data. So simple tabular data hasn't really been affected by the deep learning revolution. And I think that's really worth noting that. Uh, we've already heard actually some nice interesting discussion about the difference between AI and data analytics. I think data analytics sits in the world of tabular data, simple data sets. Um, and this has not been affected by AI and deep learning. So decision making on simple data sets and decision making over time series hasn't really had any breakthroughs in the last few years, frankly, over the last 10 years. Um, th this means that most investment decision making, I think, will not be able to gain the benefit of deep learning technology. That that's my opinion. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Very interesting indeed. Cyril, maybe you want to expand on that in terms of which uh, components you see relevant for private markets? Um, it, it, we have to follow the trail of data. And uh, the most promising applications are probably coming where you can get a flow which is highly reliable and very frequent. <clears throat> so probably you can look at cash flows. So in the custodian area, for example, you can track what's happening and maybe set some rules and then to some extent maybe use some of these advanced uh, analytics uh, and advanced tools. Um, also in the middle in the back office of, of uh, private uh, uh, equity and private market uh, uh, fund managers, you, you could set up some of these tools to track what happens. I think we shouldn't overestimate what this kind of instruments could deliver and notably because of what uh, Ludovic said earlier and, and described very accurately. Um, the other thing that we have to factor in is that actors evolve. Uh, I will take a very simple example. Um, one of the ambitions of uh, fund investors is to analyze what are the, the great uh, fund managers, especially for the future. And so one of the, the uh, analysis that they do is, is called performance attribution. And there are some very interesting academic notes which explain that actually performance attribution is usually related to the, to the individuals forming the fund manager. And so based on that, which is something that we already saw from the, the practical side before, uh, the fund manager started to set up strategies to try to actually avoid that. Uh, because one of the consequences is that if you identify some key individuals, then it will be reflected in the fund regulations, and then you will have what we call key man clauses. So whenever you get let's say, unstructured data and, and, and very unfrequent data, the actors can change their behavior in between. So as Morton just rightfully said, it, we are not dealing with a, a controlled environment, which is a Go or a chess play. It, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And, and so maybe we should, we should just start with what we can actually control, which are these cash flows that I was referring to. The, the last thing that I want to highlight is that um, if we do our job very well, it might actually trigger some interesting findings. And I think uh, one of the, let's say, the holy grail would be to control the risk of, of the fund investors and identify the next Abraj Capital, which was the equivalent of Madoff in private equity. That would be already quite a bit success, and I think we're still far off from that. Thank you, Cyril. Very interesting uh, insights already on the applications of AI in which fields basically are prone to that. So this brings me basically to my next question, which is what are the AI applications in private market investment that you know you as panelists basically see um, in, in your respective uh, businesses and also that you think are um, relevant in the general uh, view? Maybe um, 
Maria, Natalia, can uh, you start us off on this topic? Sure. Um, so in, in our view, um, so the, you want to leverage, um, you being an asset owner or asset manager, you want to leverage this application to gain some information advantage. And it's all about making prediction. Is it about the performance of the manager you're selecting as an uh, institutional investor, or is it uh, the prediction of the performance of the company that you want to invest? So it's within the realm of deal sourcing and uh, and the support you need during the due, due diligence process. And uh, as uh, Martin has reviewed well, so from the technical perspective, what, what we really need here, we need computer vision, we need natural language processing uh, to be able to um, uh, scrap on a large scale uh, unstructured data, uh, which can be set to simply because it's uh, it's not available for uh, for a proper analysis uh, as if it was um, uh, standardized and digitized. So what we're doing on our end is to facilitate the whole process of um, on one end, which is uh, the reporting coming from the managers to institutional investors so that the data can become standardized in a digital form. And so that uh, institutional investors can do precisely what Cyril just mentioned, which is the performance attribution. To understand what is the management style, uh, what is uh, the, for, for a particular manager and in the industry professional, uh, what is uh, the typical um, way how they conduct the exit, uh, where, what is the value creation bridge um, uh, style as well, so to basically come up with some uh, regression model, which would predict uh, what would be the final outcome when they decide to uh, gain exposure in, in, in private markets through that specific manager. Thank you, Maya. Thank you. Uh, Natalia, I mean, we had in our previous discussions, you know, a bit of an exchange on the applications in the investment life cycle. Anything you would like to share with the audience in that regard? Well, definitely. I think, you know, many previous speakers spoke already about, you know, some examples here and there, but I, I'm sure that there are applications, you know, for AI machine learning across the entire investment cycle from deal origination to evaluation, which, you know, has been discussed already a few times here to portfolio monitoring and uh, reporting also mentioned before. I think it's not a secret that a number of fund managers um, already use uh, technologies, NLP, machine learning uh, in identifying and evaluating the investment targets. So I think mainly we now speak about uh, growth and VC investors uh, and basically they try to find, discover the companies uh, that fit the investment criteria. And they do have a lot of in-house data. They do scrap the web so they continuously improve their models uh, to, 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 to come up with more precise search results. Uh, I think uh, Gideon before mentioned about uh, the big data coming into private market world and obviously in uh, 2020 with the pandemic, we saw quite a rise uh, you know, of interest towards big data and we saw more and more um, alternative data used in the diligence and monitoring because everyone was looking for real-time insights and obviously you know using those insights to anticipate the future so i think uh, that's very interesting you know people started tracking credit card transactions mapping com competitors and so on and so forth and that's in the in the private space already um and you know from the investment stage to post investment stage obviously we can have a few interesting users there as well and uh, one of the examples, which I think is very interesting, is the cash flow modeling based on the prediction models of performance of underlying companies. Uh, but even before that, you know, sophistication, there are also a lot of uh, very essential, but labor intensive routines uh, that require a lot of effort and on the other side, high degree of accuracy. Uh, I know some speakers also mentioned that, uh, but I think, you know, we, we have a practical 
uh, you know, example or experience on this, uh, because the last year, thanks to the NLP algorithm developed by Martin and his team at Evolution AI, we have switched from manual data input uh, to an automated extraction of information from cluster reports. So you can only imagine, you know, if we have to collect 50 data points, you know, from 300 plus funds on a quarterly basis, uh, how much effort that needs. And now it's done pretty much with one click. Thank you, Natalia. Indeed, I mean, getting information on in an opaque market is definitely, you know, the you know uh, what's challenging about this. And uh, like Gideon said in the presentation, maybe he wants to expand on a few, you know, examples on how basically increase the transparency of the data that we get eventually from private companies. We cannot hear you, Gideon. Would you please um, unmute? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so I think uh, th this is one of the opportunities, the real big opportunities of, uh, uh, of, of uh, using alternative data or big data and, and applying some, uh, some uh, AI is exactly that, to increase their transparency that, uh, that is so difficult to achieve when it, when it comes to private companies. Um, you know, just uh, this question relates to what people are using right now. So I can I, I can give you, I mean, Natalia was was uh, uh, was providing a, a, a few examples across uh, a large set of firms. I, I can tell you from from the requests we've been getting, uh, you know, people want to know uh, before Lyft and Uber went public. They want to know, you know, what's uh, you know how reliable is the kind of management disclosure. Uh, people, you know, before Aramco went public, that was the same, uh, the same case. I mean, and, and I think, um, you know, if you think about uh, uh, part of what we're doing is, you know, collecting information from, from hundreds of thousands of different uh, uh, textual sources, uh, classify them by, you know, by, we call them reservoirs. So, you know, one would be dealing with kind of the, the general media, the other would be like specifically pertaining to private equity, Publication, other would be like industry specific, whether it's defense or, 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 or um, you know, industrial and so on. And then, so the ability to get this data now that it's it's organized and extract information pertaining to individual companies with respect to their revenue growth, with respect to the you know management turnover, you know, uh, Me Too scandals, uh, you know, legal action that they might be uh, facing. Uh, product reviews, uh, you know, research and development project, new new product uh, launches, all of these actually are available. Uh, you know, when you apply this uh, this uh, you know scraping and data collection, and then on top of that, uh, try to use NLP type tools to extract you know insight, which uh, you know we all agree is very important to the private equity uh, investor. Thank you. Thank you, um, Gideon. Martin, maybe do you see this look in line with what you have at Evolution AI as expressed needs or projects that you basically deal with on a daily basis? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I can give a couple of concrete examples from, from our experience. So one um, is the extraction of data from financial statements, um, uh, as already been mentioned by Natalia. This is really challenging and a time consuming process. Um, and it's really historically been quite difficult to automate. With the previous generation of algorithms, you know, optical character recognition, which has been around for a few decades now, it's always been quite difficult to automate the extraction of data from, from complex financial documents. Uh, you know, humans find reading documents easy. Um, some, some people in the audience might even find reading financial statements easy. But in the past, machines have found this a really, really challenging problem. So deep learning has totally opened this up. So deep learning, based algorithms for natural language processing uh, now mean that you can extract data from financial statements with, with pretty good accuracy. So that, that's one example. Uh, the other use case is in deal origination. So for, for example, I spoke to a chief, chief executive of a private equity firm yesterday. Uh, they specialize in cold chain logistics companies. So he plans to make 80 acquisitions over the next five years. And for deal sourcing, they're literally Googling for cold chain logistics firms across Europe. So I, I told him it's actually quite a simple matter now to crawl the websites of 50 million or 100 million companies 
uh, quite, you know, within a reasonable time frame, and then classify them according to their business activity. So we could quite easily find all of the cold chain logistics companies in Europe, and then we could go to the corporate registries and scan their balance sheets in order to filter that set in order to find those cold chain logistics companies who have a revenue above X million pounds per year. Um, so he was actually really surprised to hear that you could do this now, uh, which shows you how, how quickly the technology is moving. But I would say, you know, that, that kind of use case is really well suited to artificial intelligence. Um, it's a very large scale problem. The reasoning is pretty simple that's needed. It's not a very complex reasoning task. I think AI is much better suited to that kind of large scale, low intellectual capability problem rather than very com complex reasoning tasks. I don't think the AI is, is really quite there yet. Thank you, Martin. Thank you to all. Indeed, a wide range of applications for AI in private markets, which definitely comes, you know, speaks challenges as many of you basically commented. So I would like to actually go forward with that question and ask you, what are the key challenges that you see for, for AI applications in private markets? Maybe Natalia can, can set us off on that. Sure, uh, I think I can only repeat you know, <laughs> many statements you know, made before. Uh, there are you know, quite strong reasons you know, why the adoption of AI and uh, machine learning private markets takes longer, you know, that we would probably want. Um, and of course, you know, scarcity and quality of data was already mentioned. Uh, and uh, there's not much we can do, I guess, with this until the industry accumulates sufficient volumes of data for, for real, like, meaningful applications. I think not only like the overall scarcity of data, but it's also, you know, I would like to mention the character of the data because we all know that private equity is people business and uh, track record analysis is just the, you know, part or formal part of our due diligence process. And a lot of judgment is based on insights which we receive through interviewing business executives. And a lot of information cannot be so easily quantified and structured, yeah. Um, at Ingestion, we have uh, developed actually a machine learning model which evaluates funds, fund opportunities, private fund opportunities, um, and we basically try to replicate our due diligence process. We have identified over 100 parameters which we thought we could quantify, and we could actually if we had the data, but again, you know, we ended up only with 40, yeah, which where we could find the data, where we could uh, basically assemble. Uh, but on the other side, you know, how can you quantify or can you ask the machine to uh, evaluate, you know, robustness of business models, the business judgment of investment professionals, uh, how machine can look at the executive team dynamics and things like this. So I think at present, you know, at the present state of development, you know, technology is not yet ready for like really doing that, that kind of analysis and judgment and really replicating human in this process. Indeed, I mean, this is something that was raised in previous discussion about, you know, how human capital intensive this industry is and the challenges it basically poses. And then we uh, listened to Ludovic Falipu comment about that, basically saying that the key word here is standardization. So if we have like standard processes, maybe uh, technically we could think of things that could be basically automated and I would like to hear uh, Gideon's uh, point of view on that, you know, from a econometrics point of view or analytics point of view. Yeah, so, so if, you, if you think about it econ econometrically and, and, you, and you're thinking, you know, what could be the next uh, step, uh, big step in, in investment in private markets, here where you see that there, there's, there's a lot of challenges that, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't be so optimistic that, uh, that would be solved that quickly. And the main challenge is what I called in my presentation earlier, the why variable. I mean, as a, you know, as an investment professional, uh, you know, managing uh, strategies systematically, the main, uh, you know, asset that we have in the public market is that you observe prices almost continuously. So then you could, you uh, uh, you know, uh, build prediction model and, and to determine the, the investment and the allocation. You can, uh, you can uh, manage risk better by, by, by um, estimating covariances between, you know, different, different assets. Uh, risk management uh, all of a sudden become a lot more doable. But then if you look at the private markets, 
uh, you know, you don't observe prices that, that often or, or, you know, like an external investor, maybe, uh, you know, hardly. And therefore, I think that, um, you know, many of the applications are so natural uh, in the investment process uh, when it comes to public uh, investment are so uh, difficult and would be, uh, I think, for, for, for the foreseeable future, uh, more challenging. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that, 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 that's, I think, a big uh, uh, thing uh, when, when we think about the, the kind of the, neck, the, the challenges uh, going forward into the kind of the next few year. Um, so it would be, it would be hard to, um, to, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, to, to replicate, uh, some of the advantages that we get, the benefit that we get from, uh, uh um, from AI in the public market, uh, in, in the, apply them to the, to the private ones. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Martin, would you like to expand on that, on the technical aspect, you know, what evolution AI, anything you see, uh, that you could add basically? Um, yeah, I, you know, there's something I, I wanted to say was, was that it, it's become quite clear recently in the AI community, but, but I think less clear in the, in the media. Um, it's become clear that in some ways, current AI technology is fundamentally limited in a way that human intelligence really isn't. Um, you know, we've all heard that deep learning needs large sets of da training data in order to perform well, but I don't think it's really been quite clear why that is until recently. So now it's becoming evident that the reasoning capabilities of the neural networks are quite limited. So, so I'll give you an example. You can train uh, a neural network on a large quantity of data and it will start to understand, to some extent, numbers. Well, it's, it will start to manipulate numbers. Um, you, can, you can perform simple sums, for example, with a neural network. But if you give them a number that they've never seen before, they just completely fail to deal with it which is, think, if you think about it, really, really unusual. I mean, if you gave a, a human being, uh, if you taught a human being how to add, uh, you, you know, simple arithmetic, like adding numbers, you don't need to show a human being every single number in order for the human to, to, to be able to calculate. And that's because humans can extrapolate from those tasks. Humans can just learn the general principle. And this doesn't seem to be happening with neural networks. This is, I think, quite important to understand. And it's a phenomenon that you see again and again across many different types of use cases, and is not often mentioned um, amidst all of the hype around AI. Um, and I think this really matters because if the algorithms have this severe constraints that they can't really extrapolate from data to general principles, then how can they deal with new economic shocks or new world events? Uh, and that's something that we haven't really solved yet, uh, and, and it's something that I, I think we should bear in mind. Interesting indeed, Martin, indeed. Integrating surprises and unexpected events, basically, in those learning processes. Uh, Maria, would you like to add something about, you know, the human capital aspect uh, that is linked to those challenges? Would be very uh, much uh, like to hear you. Yes. So when, when uh, people talk about whether the machines are going to replace humans, I think there is a, a very, um, that people are extrapolating it to a limit. So. I think uh, uh, human um, involvement and contribution in this and the machine contribution are complementary. So what machines should do, for example, in the, in the deal sourcing is to, and deal origination is to uh, create a short list of uh, deals. So to discover um, by, first of all, providing some uh, alternative data, some proxies, as uh, Gideon mentioned, some proxies for the fundamentals of the companies, finding some hidden gems. But then it will boil down in the end to uh, a reputation game. I don't expect to see that a founder of a company who managed it for, for a few decades would want to sell it to a machine, to sit uh, at a table with a machine and sell, sell its child company, right? So, um, so basically, Machines should help us gain what I mentioned before. The game of finance is game about having an information advantage, and that's what, what we will use the machines for. But in the end, the whole negotiation game, uh, relationship game, it's, it's down to humans. There is one thing which is interesting, though, the potential uh, repercussions on the, on the organizational behavior. 
uh, something that I thought about would be um, so earlier we would see uh, a new hires, uh, tens or hundreds of analysts in a company who would be doing this job of finding and um, um, uh, analyzing the potential targets. Now, if machines are replacing them, we would see fewer uh, fewer analysts in a company, and then. We would not see any more the pyramid structures in the organizations, but something which resembles more of a column. So how things are going to evolve in the immediate future, we're about to see. But this is something I'm, I'm quite curious about. Thank you, Maria. Thank you uh, to all the panels. So a, a wide range, I would like to say, of applications and challenges that obviously come up with it. So to end on a prospective note, basically, I would like to ask the panelists where they see AI going in the next five to 10 years in, in private markets. Cyril, maybe you would like to uh, set us off on this one? Sure. Um, I don't have really a reliable crystal ball, um, so I can make only an educated guess. I think, uh, and I would follow up on what Maria just said, we're going to see more tools supporting humans um, and probably dealing with the highly boring and automatable uh, tasks. Um, I also think that it, it might come up as a very useful instrument when it becomes more accessible to the layman, uh, because today any kind of data analytic tool requires quite a certain level of sophistication. And one of the things that I also think is that for a foreseeable future, humans will have to deal with the data first before, before feeding it to the machine. Because as I said, nothing stays equal and so the machine can only go so far and what we observed especially in other areas not in private markets but where we applied for example some of these data analytics it's been very highly sensitive to uh, low quality data very noisy data and also data gaps uh, we know that for example in credit scoring automated credit scoring some minorities are uh, heavily um, let's say uh, discriminated against and, and that's something we want to avoid in private markets, for example. Thank you, Cyril. Anyone else from our panelists would like to add any insight on perspective of AI in private markets? Uh, I, yeah. Yeah, good <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I just like um, continuing the thread of, uh, you know, kind of uh, the, the, the investment process, the selection process. I, I think there, uh, right now, I mentioned before the challenges, not observing the Y variable. I think uh, if we, if we want to look uh, down to the future, I think the opportunity to overcome the challenge would come uh, where I think uh, Ludo, Ludo uh, addressed in his presentation uh, the ability to uh, use mimicking uh, a public public uh, uh, traded portfolio to mimic private equity investment, I kind of propose to do the other way around uh, to overcome uh, the the Y variable challenge by observing features that we described, the features of, pri of private companies, match them with features of public companies, and then, uh, uh, and then uh, 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 imply the price Therefore, if, if we do that, and I call it in my presentation, the Zillow model, uh, then uh, you know, there is an opportunity now to have a much uh, 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 wealthier uh, sets of data when it comes to econometrics panel. And, and from, that, from that, if we do that jump, I believe there is an opportunity to really re revolutionize the private equity investment process and make it more automated um, as a result, more risk managed, more automated, as a result. Thank you, Gideon. Uh, yes, Natalia. Yeah, I think I just wanted to agree with Cyril. I think uh, in the nearest future, midterm, even, you know, we will be mainly focused on automation of routine tasks, uh, just introducing efficiencies, cost savings, because this is something where we have, you know, sufficient uh, need and sufficient, sufficient data. Um, I think what we haven't touched upon so far is the, the regulatory aspect. Uh, what I was thinking about is that, um, you know, at some point we will get the data, you know, about the company's financials, uh, fund performance, and so on and so forth. I mean, this is something just, you know, a matter of time to gather that. 
but you know i think we will still want to get more insights from the you know from the human side you know of of uh, how how and analyze you know people teams uh and again you know probably we'll get our hands around or we'll try to get our hands around some private data but Already now we're facing the GDPR issue. You know we cannot really access private information in a massive way. Um, we cannot use NLP. You know when we, for example, run the interviews with with executives just to analyze a bit. You know the the, the behaviors, or the dynamics. I mean we cannot analyze the sentiment that they send over to us. You know when we interview them. So I think you know this all will keep us away from a uh, high degree of precision in in modeling, uh, but that's definitely the ambition. So we'll see again, you know, how how regulation will also look at the attempts, you know, of researchers and practitioners uh, to to use AI in in their daily business. Thank you, thank you, Natalia. Thank you to everyone for the great insights. I think we have a couple questions in the chat box. Uh, I'm going to read them out loud and then, you know, uh, we could basically address them. Um, so we have a question from Jacob. Would you let AI and machine learning decide on a company deal level investment? No. The answer is no, definitely not. Um, because it depends what I uh, plan to do with the company and the entrepreneur. You know, statistically, I'm going to invest for the next five years which, by the way, is the average uh, lifetime of a marriage in, in a major metropolis in the Western world. So before I do that, I'd like to date a few times and get to know uh, the other person I'm going to work with. The machine cannot do that. And that at the end of the day, if I'm successful, it's because I could create a relationship with the person in front of me, and, uh, and we're going to do great things together, me as an investor and he or her as an entrepreneur. So I wouldn't rely on the machine to tell me to do that. What I would like to ask the machine is to support me when I do the due diligence, which is an extensive work and requires a lot of effort, like criminal and background checks. All of that is, is, is a lot of time consuming work. And, and what you just want to know is, are, are they in, in the database or not? But just querying it properly is, is, is quite a bit of time. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvie. Anybody would like to jump on that and add? Um add anything okay then i move to the next question from zoran who is uh saying that ai is definitely powerful and he's quite skeptical about whether it can beat experienced pe professionals when it comes to target selection so there are quite a set of skills that are not you know replaceable and he asks the question do you think that ai and data mining could start replacing pe managers in the deal selection process in the near future this joins probably the previous question. Yeah, it's similar to, to a certain degree. And I think I, I also mentioned before that, you know, at, at the current state, you know, of development of technology is just impossible. And I gave an example, you know, of how many parameters we would want to include in our modeling, but we simply cannot. And uh, obviously it's the chemistry in, in our you know, brain that sometimes produce results. I mean, we, we always claim that, okay, the model help us get rid of the biases, but sometimes, you know, sometimes the biases actually do the right thing. You know, it's about your good investment knows, you know, to identify the right opportunity. But again, I would agree with Cyril, uh, AI can help us filter, you know, the humongous, you know, <laughs> amount of opportunities that we see and really focus on those that have a better chance, you know, of being successful. But of course, you know, the, the judgment is uh, with us, with investment professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Yes, Martin, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. Um, uh, I'm a scientist, so I would not, I actually wouldn't like to speculate on the answers to this question. I think we would need to perform a properly controlled scientific experiment and uh, you know it, it would be easy to set up and, and I think that there ha obviously has been some work on this but but I think um, I think if we run an experiment we maybe would be surprised with the answer. Indeed quite philosophical in a way. Um, any other questions from the audience uh, please uh, you can still unmute or write in the in the chat box. 
there are any other questions coming from the audience? If not, I hand it over to you, Emmanuel. Thank you all. Uh, to our panelists and listeners, it's been great uh, being part of this event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, uh, member of the panel. Uh, very interesting uh, second session. So before we close the, the conference, uh, let me, uh, on behalf of the organization uh, our committee, uh, make some statements. So the first is that all uh, the material of today, uh, the slides, will be available on the House of Finance Paris Dauphine uh, dedicated web page for the conference. So you will be able, in fact, to retrieve the slides. There will be also a YouTube uh, channel where you will be able uh, to see, in fact, uh, the video recorded of the presentations. Uh, second important statement is that we already agreed uh, with the organization committee with respect to the fifth uh, edition that will still be in the Lemon area. Uh, the dates will be, so you can please book them in your agenda. There will be a uh, one day and a half conference. We, we have to go back to the original setting with, we hope, face-to-face -face, uh, presentation from academia and from the industry. Uh, so it will be the Thursday, 30 June, and it will be on the Friday, 1st of July. Uh, last statement is I would like, uh, before ending this uh, conference, to, uh, on behalf again uh, of the organization committee, to uh, take the opportunity to thank uh, our speakers. Uh, thank for our two uh, great uh, academic uh, speakers, Rudy and Ludo. Thank you very much for your insight. Thank you also to Ali, Marija, um, to Gideon, Yegor, Marie, Sarah, Cyril, Dorte, Martin, Melissa, Natalia, and Paula. Thank you very much for all your insight. I will also take the opportunity to thank again our partners, our corporate partner, Unigestion, which is there from the start. Uh, also, um, Efront uh, and Campbell Utens, and our two academic partners, namely uh, Paris Dauphine and EPFL. Uh, I will also want to, to address some special thanks for the organization of this conference uh, to Aida Amdi from Dauphine, to Melody Cataneo from Unigestion, and to the technical team from the studio. And naturally, I want to thank uh, the attendees, all the participants to this conference. So I wish you a good uh, uh, summer break, and uh, I hope to see you uh, next year for the fifth edition um, on private market. Thank you very much.